and we'll get the third one up there and we'll have um, all three on the website for you. So uh, at this point you should know Jim. And today we're going to cover nutrient removal, handling of biosolids, and we're going to overview industrial pretreatment. So send me questions at any time and I'll go ahead and hand it off to Jim. Okay, thanks Drew. Uh, first of all, any questions, uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we've been together, any questions on what we've talked about today? DOD degradation. Yeah. Well, in the first two classes we pretty much took care of the, uh, the water end of the business. Today we're going to talk about uh, what we call uh, advanced treatment, some people refer to it as tertiary treatment. Uh, we're going to talk about nutrient removal, that additional step that we're being uh, pressed into doing now to remove nitrogen and phosphorus from the uh, discharge water. We'll also talk about what happens to all of this material that came in as BOD and we convert it into microorganisms. We've taken them out of the process to our secondary clarifier. Now what happens to them? And then we'll just do a quick overview of what happens on the industrial side. Uh, regulations on industry to essentially protect the POTWs, the uh, treatment facility from problems that might come from metals or organics or other materials not conducive to biological treatment. So, first of all, nutrient removal. This is something that's been uh, in increasing demand over the past uh, 15 years or more. Uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, what we're referring to when we talk about nutrient removal. I don't know what this plant is, but it's a nice looking plant. Increasingly, uh, particularly here in New England, Massachusetts is very hard hit with uh, nitrogen removal. Nitrogen uh, is a big thing. It's also part of eutrophication with the phosphorus. Phosphorus has become even more increasing over the past uh, five to eight years or so. And again, remember what we do here is we're pretty much doing what nature would do. Nature does nitrification. It happens in the ground all the time with certain organisms. Uh, and we're going to use, uh, in this situation, it's largely biological process. But in order to get to certain levels uh, in our permits now, we do have to resort on some chemical usage to get those numbers down as low as they possibly can. Again, ultimately, we're going to discharge waters that don't harm the intended use of the uh, water body. So, these days, function of most plants, certainly in our region, is to reduce carbonaceous BOD. That was the standard set forth in the Clean Water Act. That was the base of all of our treatment, get rid of the organic matter as much as possible. Uh, we now have to reduce nitrogenous BOD, another oxygen demand that's placed on uh, the water streams by uh, ammonia and nitrogen compounds. We have to remove the nitrogen oven by itself. Then we move that as a nitrogen gas. How we, uh, we can convert that into. And again, now the, the latest thing and the more difficult of the two is phosphorus removal. Uh, numbers for phosphorus removal are extremely low and we can't achieve them biologically alone. So we do have to rely on some uh, chemical usage and, of course, disinfection to break down pathogens and remove that from the system. You have to refresh your memory. This these processes, biological nutrient removal, is generally done with an activated sludge process. Uh, fixed film processes like trickling filters and RBCs can remove nitrogen relatively well, but you don't have enough control over it, and they're certainly not good at phosphorus removal. So typically when a plant has to upgrade for phosphorus removal, if it's a fixed film process, they will add to their process a activated sludge system, that that's where we have the ultimate control over what goes on in the process. Okay, we still have our biological reactor, we still have to provide air to these organisms, and as you'll see, we're going to have to provide more air to keep things going. And we have our clarifier. The bulk of this work can be done in these units. Yeah, we're largely talking to two different types of bacteria that are involved. We have heterotrophic bacteria. They're the ones that go after carbonaceous BOD. Organic compounds come in, they go through a synthesis, they consume and break down these organic materials, make more organisms, and off we go. Uh, they do, and this is something that's important to remember when we talk about biological nutrient removal, 
swivel. We do need a certain amount of nutrients to keep the organisms in good shape. So we don't want to totally remove all the nitrogen and phosphorus at certain locations. We have to be careful how we achieve this process. Uh, again, heterotrophs, aerobes, they require free molecular oxygen. They need dissolved oxygen in the wastewater. That's the whole principle behind pumping a bunch of air into these tanks. Uh, they can also be anaerobic and thrive in the total absence of dissolved oxygen. But the bulk of them are facultative bacteria and adjust to the situation. We have to rely on these guys to do some of our work for us. Now, autotrophic bacteria are the ones that rely on inorganic carbon, carbon dioxide, or other sources of oxygen, such as nitrates and sulfates. It's bound oxygen, but they can break that down and get that for their energy needs. Uh, they're the ones that are going to help us with denitrification. Learn what that term really means a little bit later on. They're all functioning pretty much the same way, just get different sources of energy. And of course, we remember that for every 100 pounds of carbon that we're going to deal with, we need five pounds of nitrogen, one pound of phosphorus. It's important to remember, particularly when we get into phosphorus removal, because some processes can remove too much at the wrong place. When we talked about dissolved oxygen demand, when we talked about just plain carbon removal, we set a minimum of 0.5 milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. We want much more now, and you'll see why as we look at the nitrification process. So what we need to do, the whole control of the system develops the proper environment and develop the proper population of organisms to achieve these means. We're going to have to specifically grow a particular type of organisms for our nitrification process. Again, we're just talking with single-celled bacteria. When we look at the heterotrophs on the left-hand column, uh, the flock-forming bacteria, that's great. That's going to help us clean up the water in our secondary clarifier. Filamentous bacteria are good to a degree, depending on the type and the amount that we have. Uh, again, generally we're dealing with aerobic bacteria. There may be a situation where we actually need to go anaerobic, something that we try to avoid at all costs up to this point. We use it, and you'll see that in the solids handling. You'll also see it in phosphorus removal. Again, the bulk of them are facultative bacteria. They can move back and forth between systems uh, pretty well. Uh, the group on the right-hand side, these autotrophs, one ways off of this little thing, uh, the nitrosomonas and the nitrobacters, those are the ones that are going to remove the nitrogen for us. We'll see how that all works out. So again, it goes back, really gets started. Nitrification process date back to the 70s, but uh, Congress uh, came up with a report and found that uh, a lot of the problem with our rivers and streams and lakes was eutrophication, too many nutrients going in and causing issues. What happens? We put ammonium compounds into the stream. There's an oxygen demand. Again, it depletes the oxygen in the stream. Aquatic life has difficulty living. Uh, you have toxicity with nitrates. Nitrates uh, are a cause of, uh, if you're familiar, I can't get the term out, methyl, or whatever it is, blue baby syndrome. That gets in your drinking water. You have a lot of trouble with some birth defects. Uh, you have groundwater contamination. And again, the eutrophication. With nitrogen and phosphorus, same stuff that in about two months we'll be throwing on our lawns so we can cut the grass every Saturday. You throw that in the river and all you do is promote aquatic vegetation. It chokes off the stream and you end up with something that looks like this. Here's the negative side of the whole thing. Uh, again, you said in the upper uh, left corner and work your way down through the boxes, again, nitrogen is a nutrient for vegetation. So grows a lot of algae, other plants, they die, they drop to the bottom of the tank, they break down, and you've probably seen ponds that when you were much younger were nice little ponds that maybe you played with during the summer, but now when you drive by them they're just almost a bog because all this vegetation dies off and the pond eventually just kind of disappears. Nitrogen is quite plentiful. It comes from plants, it comes from animal and human waste. Protein, urea, ammonium, bacterial decomposition can give off nitrogen. There's a lot of sources of nitrogen. And if you look at the different types, we have 
organic nitrogen, both particulate and soluble. We have uh, ammonia nitrogen. And when you add all of those three together, it's what we call total Keldahl nitrogen. And then we have the nitrite and the nitrates. Those don't necessarily exist in nature very much. But the other three will. We have to remove them. So nitrification is biological conversion of ammonium compounds into nitrite and then nitrate ions. And we do this by adding a lot more oxygen and by developing a specific type of organism. Again, this occurs quite readily in nature. It happens in the ground very well. There's a lot of nitrifiers out there. Uh, and this is really what's kind of happening. We've got these two particular organisms that we have to develop. Uh, the nitrosomonas on the left and the nitrobacter on the right. If you look at them, you can see the different shapes to them. The nitrosomonas are a spherical type of an organism, and the nitrobacters are more of a rod-shaped organism. The fact is, if you look at them under the microscope and you find them on flock particles, and you'll see them existing on the edges of the flock particles, they'll generally be on opposite sides of that particle. They don't like each other, so they stay as far away from each other as possible. But we see as we come into the process, we've got soluble BOD readily available. Uh, we need a certain amount of alkalinity in the process. And our ammonia nitrogen comes in, the nitrosomonas bacteria, little spherical guys, with the addition of a fair amount of oxygen, will break down the ammonia compounds into nitrites, NO2 nitrogen. And then the nitrobacters, with yet more oxygen, will take the nitrites, break them down into nitrate nitrogen. That's how we break down that ammonia. But now we still have a lot of nitrogen in the system. We'll have to break that down through denitrification, which we'll see in a while. So again, they're very common. We do not generate any nitrifiers. They have to come in through infiltration. They come in out of the ground. That's why we, you know, we don't have an extremely tight uh, collection system. We, a few leaks here and there isn't a bad thing. Again, they are autotrophs. They use carbon dioxide and organic carbon for their cellular uh, synthesis, and they're very slow. We have to control our process so that we have sufficient time to develop these organisms. Uh, if you remember the term uh, MCRT, mean cell residence time or solids retention time, the average time an organism stays in the system. Uh, for carbon removal, three to five days is more than adequate. Nitrifiers, in order to develop them, first of all, they're very temperature dependent. If you were trying to start them this time of year, you'd have a heck of a time. They don't like cold water. Uh, but in the right circumstances, we're looking up 8, 10, 12 days of an MCRT. So we have to change our process so we retain these organisms for a much longer time in order to develop these two. And the slower of the two is actually the nitrobacter, which can cause problems if you don't uh, keep that in mind. Again, yeah, nitrosomonas is spherical, roughly one micron in size. They reproduce by binary fission, like most of the uh, organisms out there. The nitrobacters are rod shaped and they're just a little bit smaller, but they reproduce by budding. They actually will have a little organism start to branch off from the side of them, and then that breaks free and goes off on its own. Again, the nitrosomonas are fairly quick. We can readily break down the ammonium compounds into the nitrites. The difficulty is going then from nitrite to nitrate because the nitrobacters are slower growing. And this term that you see down below is this, this is an issue that some facilities will get into uh, if they're not paying attention. If they don't need to nitrify and they don't pay attention to what they're doing, they increase their MCRT, they'll get into a situation where they can break the ammonium compounds down into nitrites, but they're not sufficiently developed in order to break it down to nitrates and then go on. And if you have a lot of nitrites in your system, it's called what we call the chlorine sponge. It's going to suck the living daylights out of your chlorine demand. You're going to be throwing chlorine there all day and never get what you're looking for. It's a good indication that you've gone into this nitrite lock, partial nitrification. <coughs> so in order to nitrify, again, in summer, you can probably get away down around five, six days. 
generally up around 10 is where you're safe. pH has got to be in the, the proper range. And the key to it in this uh, facilities that get caught in that partial nitrification, uh, some part of it is because they don't have sufficient alkalinity. You need enough alkalinity in your incoming wastewater so that after the nitrification process, you've got 50 milligrams per liter as a residual. That's the minimum you want left over at the time. So a lot of facilities will need to supplement their alkalinity up front with something like sodium hydroxide or mag hydroxide, bicarbonate, something like that. At the beginning, at the process. At the beginning you want to have it in there because it's going to get consumed. Dissolved oxygen, minimum of two. Part of it is because we want to make sure we've got sufficient oxygen to get all the way inside the flock, and you need all of that extra oxygen, as we're going to see, uh, as we go through the process. Again, temperature 50 to 30 degrees, you're not going to get started below 50 degrees, not very easily. So come wintertime, and nitrification and phosphorus removal generally are seasonal limits. Uh, some just have a clean break that from April 1st to October 30th, you have to Remove these items down to a much lower level. Wintertime, what we call the non-growing period, nobody's swimming in the rivers, the aquatic vegetation's not going to do much at those temperatures, so they don't care about it. And some, like Upper Blackstone, will work down through a couple of brackets. They go from April 1st to May 1st, and from May 1st to June, and then through the summer months, it's the lowest that they have. Once you've got it going, you may be able to keep it going through the winter months. Our process that we had up in Nashville, we were able to get through winter, we just never shut it down because we were afraid we'd never get started again. So once you got to keep it. And if you want to look at it from a chemical standpoint, this is what's coming in. We've got our ammonium ion, and the ammonium compounds coming in. For every gram of ammonium, we have to add one and a half grams of oxygen. Very expensive to add this extra oxygen. And that's going to form the nitrites. And the hydrogen ion is what's consuming that alkalinity. You'll actually see a little pH depression as you go through the process because of basically forming some acid. Then the nitrobacters, like the nitrite, the NO2, again, another half gram of oxygen to form the nitrite. Nitrate. And if you look at it overall, the oxygen demand for every gram of ammonia nitrogen coming into the process four and a half grams of oxygen to complete the reaction. And here's where the other expense comes in. You, you need 7.14 grams of alkalinity for every gram of ammonia nitrogen you're going to de destroy. So you need some chemical assistance to get this process to uh, go to completion. Again, our microscopic exam is very helpful in looking at the uh, condition of our process, the health of the process. These two particular uh, stock stilliates, Epistillus and Vorticella, are very common with a good operating nitrification process. Uh, we don't know if they actually do some of the nitrification or if they just like the conditions under the, promote that uh, good nitrification, but they're very common to be found when everything is running well. So again, very temperature dependent. Below five degrees C, nitrification will probably stop. It's too cold to develop these guys. Uh, 10 degrees you can get going, but it's only at 20% of the rate. Ideally, you're up around 25, 30 degrees uh, Celsius for this to work. And pretty much all biological activity is going to stop when you get above 45. Again, if you look at it, MCRTs in terms of when you're going to start your process, uh, if you're at 10 degrees, which is only 50 degrees, that's about what the temperature of the wastewater is right now, in all probability. Take you about 30 days MCRT to develop the proper organism to get this job done. It certainly gets easier as you get warmer. But this is something that in the next month, uh, facilities that don't have nitrification operating through the winter will start to adjust their process so that they can start uh, developing these organisms. It's going to take them 15 to 20 days, depending on how their temperatures run through the process to get started in the spring. So they'll be starting in March to make sure they're ready for April. Yet the alkalinity is a critical part, and something that often gets overlooked to 
the degree that it needs to be watched. Again, you're going to have a drop in pH over this process as that hydrogen ion gets released from the ammonium compounds. Uh, you, and if you don't have enough alkalinity and your pH drops below 6, 7, you're going to start to inhibit your process. You've got to have that in there to make it work right. Again, we need at least 50 milligrams per liter after the process is done. At the end of the reactor, you should have at least 50 milligrams per liter. If we can't do that, then we need to add some supplemental alkalinity to get the process done. Or there is a way to get some of that back that we're going to see in a little bit. Uh, okay, if you look at this uh, plant here, we've got a plant flow of 10 million gallons a day. We've got uh, influent ammonia compounds of 28 milligrams per liter. Again, I need 7.2 essentially pounds of alkalinity for every pound of ammonium coming in. So if I do my calculation, it tells me that I need 16,800 pounds of alkalinity coming into my process in order to overcome what's going to be consumed through the uh, nitrification process. When I break that down to a dosage, that's 202 milligrams per liter being added to this process. Things that can be used, you could use hydrated lime, you could use quick lime, which would need to be slaked. Uh, soda ash. Soda ash is uh, not a very strong base. Uh, it'll add alkalinity, but It'll take a fair amount of it. You've got good control over it. Sodium hydroxide is very common. Uh, sodium hydroxide, depending on what you're using, can be very hot. You can watch your pHs rise too fast if you're not careful. Uh, magnesium hydroxide is a good one. Uh, upper Blackstone just switched from sodium hydroxide to mag hydroxide. Think about magnesium hydroxide is no matter how much you throw in, your pH will never go beyond 9. So you don't have to worry about blowing the place up. It just won't go into solution anymore. And then the sodium bicarb is another very safe, uh, easy one to use. What's the cheapest? Cheapest? The cheapest is probably quicklime. But then you have to have the process to slake it. It's miserable stuff. It plugs your lines. It's full of grit. Nasty stuff. That's why it's cheap. Again, industry, and we'll be talking about industry later on. We have pretreatment programs over there, up there to help... Uh, keep our processes from being messed up by various chemicals and metals. And as you can see, particularly on the metals uh, side of things, uh, how small a dosage of any of these heavy metals that can start to inhibit the uh, nitrification process. You've got platers in town or circuit board manufacturers. You've got to keep a very close eye on those folks. So again, by the right MCRT, depending on the temperatures that we're dealing with, Adjust your wasting rates accordingly. Keep your dissolved oxygen at a two minimum. Make sure we get sufficient oxygen out there. Watch your pHs and make sure the alkalinity is where it should be. And do a very, very good job. Yes? Uh, just before you get much further, I think it's specific to a recent slide, but uh, what did you mean when you said improve the efficiency of the denitrification process? And how, how is that done? Uh, we're going to get into denitrification just in a few minutes All here. Right. So Great. We'll see how that works. Uh, Can I ask a So the, the, for tertiary treatment then, if let's say the residence time is 10 days, so they have to have okay, 10 million gallons, they have to have a minimum of 100 million gallons capacity? No, it's, a, it's not a hydraulic retention time. It's how long you keep the bugs in, based on how much you waste. Okay. So again, we bulked up. Remember, bugs don't work very well during the winter time, so we tend to build up our mixed liquor solids for the winter time, so we've got enough organisms to work at half speed. So now that as we move towards March and April and the water's going to start to warm up, they get more active, uh, we typically would tend to get rid of a lot of those guys because they're all going to start multiplying and uh, we'll get out of control. So we're going to control our wasting to the point where they're going to slow down, they're going to hold more in there for a longer period of time. It's all, it all comes down to how much you waste. It's not a hydraulic, so we don't need 100 million gallons. We just hold in the bugs in that much longer. Okay. So, again, nitrification can be done very well. We can achieve our limits without too much real trouble, as long as we keep uh, these important parameters in mind uh, very well. We really, the only supplement is worrying about alkalinity. The only chemical we might need to do. Bugs do a great job of that. 
But now I've got a lot of nitrates in the system. I've converted the ammonium compounds down into nitrates, and I have to deal with my nitrates. because They can be problematic. So we go through a process called denitrification. And what we're going to do, you see the, the little uh, cylinder on the right-hand side. That's what we call a settleometer. I don't know if you remember that from last week. We look at settleometers to judge how well our clarifiers are going to do. Uh, but what you, if you look at that closely, you'll see there's a big blob of uh, brown flock kind of moving towards the upper portion of the cylinder. Uh, that's the result of denitrification. If we don't do something, if we're going to put this material in a clarifier. Uh, it's going to be in the clarifier for probably two to three hours. It hasn't seen any oxygen for some time since it left the reactor. And it's just going to sit there. We still have some amount of BOD. We still have a lot of bugs. And they want to feed. Since when we've pretty much lost our dissolved oxygen, this is where the autotrophs start working. They start looking for another source of oxygen, nitrates. There's an oxygen there. So they're going to go after that O that's on the nitrate. They're going to consume that. And in the process, they release nitrogen as a gas. Nitrogen's gone. Up in the atmosphere, it's 78% nitrogen anyways. Who's going to notice? The problem is we don't want this to happen in a clarifier because that little blob of flock, is, consider that into 124 clarifiers, is going to be a big mess on top of the surface of that thing, and you don't want any flock at the top of that surface. You want clean water because it's there. So we have to take care of this now. A lot of permits have total nitrogen limits, not just ammonia nitrogen, but total nitrogen. So we have to get rid of this nitrogen. Uh, if we do it properly, it's cost effective. It helps us save some money. And we'll also eliminate the problem of rising solids in the clarifier. So again, we've talked about aerobic, anaerobic. We're going to bring in a new term now, this bottom uh, sentence of anoxic, anoxic respiration. Anoxic respiration is when they go after those bound oxygen molecules. An anoxic system basically has no dissolved oxygen. Any, typically look at anything less than 0.3 milligrams per liter as anoxic. It's not anaerobic because we have sulfates or nitrates, carbon dioxide, oxygen in the water. It's just bound up. This is what we're going to use, this part of the principle, to help us with it. So, again, nitrification, if you don't plan for it, can be a problem. I had this issue in my plant. I had a horrible time because we weren't set up to really denitrify well. Again, if you look at this uh, diagram here, it shows the sludge at the bottom of the tank. Again, well, organisms are looking for oxygen so that they can respirate and reproduce. They break off the nitrogen consume the oxygen, that leaves, and you can see the uh, in picture number two, all these little white spots are indicating nitrogen gas bubbles. You get enough nitrogen gas bubbles, and boom, it lifts the sludge, and now you've got, as in number three, you see the sludge slowly moving up towards the surface, clouding up your effluent, putting suspended solids in there. It's a problem. So again, if we look at Nitrification here in our chart. Nitrification is going to consume 4.6 milligrams per milligram of oxygen and 7.2 of alkalinity. Denitrification done in a certain fashion will allow you to recover essentially half both of those compounds. But to do it, our denitrification must precede nitrification. Sounds kind of weird, huh? We're going to denite before we night. Let's see how we can do that. So, for denitrification, first has to be nitrates. We must be nitrifying. Uh, we have to go into an anoxic condition, essentially zero uh, dissolved oxygen. We need some carbon there because if there's no food for the bugs. They're not going to eat anything. Uh, sometimes they actually go uh, endogenous. Roughly three milligrams per uh, milligram of nitrate, a little bit left over. And you need your bugs. Now, these are not specific bugs. They're just your normal uh, facultative organisms. 
So there's no particular uh, MCRT associated with denitrifying bacteria. It just worked that well. And this is our chemical version of it. Our nitrate plus some BOD for food, and then break down into nitrite and some CO2. Then the nitrite, again, some more food, the bacteria will then form CO2 again and give off nitrogen as a gas. That's how we actually remove nitrogen from the stream. So what we're going to do is we need a selector. Selector is a portion of a tank where we determine different conditions for it. We're going to have an anoxic selector, so we want a tank with virtually no free dissolved oxygen. And we're going to have some recycle lines and all that, and all those have to be subsurface so we don't generate any uh, oxygen being absorbed. This is the most efficient way to do it. What we've got here is this portion of our reactor. At the very uh, beginning of our reactor, our primary effluent is going to come in, our return sludge is going to come into this selector, and it's going to be anoxic. We have no aeration at all. We'll have a mixer because we want to keep everything in suspended. We've still got mixed liquor coming back in. We don't want to settle it to the bottom. So this is where we're going to denitrify. But you say, well, you haven't nitrified yet. No, we're going to nitrify in this aerobic section because nitrification is an aerobic activity. As we go through the aerobic section, nitrifiers are breaking down the ammonium compounds and forming nitrites. So what we're going to do is we've got, uh, you see this little box here at the end, uh, right of the tank, and the line coming back, we've got a pump that's going to recirculate our wastewater from the end of our biological reactor. So what we've got here is a nitrite-rich stream that's being sent into this anoxic zone. And they come in here, you've got a lot of food, you've got a lot of bugs because we've got our return sludge coming in here, but they've got no oxygen being added, so they go after the nitrites. And our nitrogen gas comes out of this tank. This recycle flow can run anywhere from one to four times your plant flow. So if this primary effluent flow is 10 milligrams, uh, 10 million gallons a day, the recycle stream could be upwards of 40 million gallons a day. And this is how we reclaim some oxygen. And this is how we reclaim some of that alkalinity. Yeah, we can get essentially 50% of what is consumed here in the reactor, we can get it back in the anoxic zone. So we don't have to really add so much, if any. Again, our conditions in that are essentially anoxic, no aeration. It might have cyclical aeration just to keep things in suspension, but now they have these uh, new parabolic mixes that are out there to keep things moving. We need a carbon source. Again, in that situation, it's primary effluent, lots of carbon there. It could be endogenous. They may have to turn on each other as a food source. And as we're going to see, other processes, we're actually going to add carbon, generally in the form of methanol or something similar to that. Again, we still need mixing in order to keep things in suspension. This is uh, the MLE process, modified lutzak ettinger one we just looked at, basically. It's our anoxic zone, there's our aerobic zone. Again, one to four times your plant flow is being recycled back to the anoxic. We can get down to very low numbers quite easily. This is an enhanced MLE. Uh, enhanced because what they've done is they've duplicated the anoxic and aerobic sections after the original one basically doing it twice. In order to make sure they have sufficient carbon source, you actually add methanol. And there are some uh, proprietary things out there, one called Micro-C, which you might hear of. It's basically like an alcohol, a food source. Uh, you could use sugar, you can, anything the bugs want to eat would work well. And the reason that this works, this will be kind of a polish uh, on the anoxic zone for denitrification, plus your aerobic here, so that you don't denitrate or anything into your clarifier. See, the numbers get even lower. We're 6 to 10 in the uh, <coughs> excuse me, modified uh, MLE, and now the enhanced is 2 to 5. 
MLD with a denitrification filter. This is somewhat common in some plants as we're going to go through our typical anoxic aerobic process, denitrify and nitrify, and then again, as a polish on the end, they actually go through a denitrification filter. It's basically a, a fixed film type of an operation. We're going to add methanol after our clarifier. The organisms live in the sand filter, and they'll do the denitrification going through there. Sequence of batch reactors actually can be modified very well for nitrogen removal just by adjusting their cycles. Basically, you have your recycle here. You start up where you just don't aerate at all, and that's your anoxic zone. You give off all of your nitrites into nitrogen, then go through the regular process. Uh, this particular uh, beast that you're looking at, the five-stage Barden foe, <coughs> but I moved it back from this particular location. This is a very complex situation. This is actually doing both phosphorus and nitrogen removal. This anaerobic zone you see up front is for phosphorus removal. And then we go through, much like the uh, enhanced MLE, anoxic, oxic, and then anoxic, anoxic again, just to make sure we get our nitrogen numbers down as low as possible. And I'll explain the whole reason behind this uh, anaerobic zone when we get into the uh, phosphorus removal portion. Oxidation ditches by uh, adjusting your aerators so that you have an anoxic zone, an aerobic zone, uh, it can work very well in doing it also. Uh, this is actually North Conway. They do a very good job. And they are particularly uh, tight on their nitrogen levels because they're actually a groundwater discharge. You go through the trees, you've got the Saco River, which is a, one of those preserved rivers, so they can't discharge there. They actually bump it into the ground. That's why they're really concerned over nitrates. So it works very well up there. So again, part of the control is to make sure we have no oxygen in that anoxic zone, going back to it. As your dissolved oxygen increases, the bugs will go after that because it's a lot easier than trying to break it off of the uh, nitrites. Got to be careful. So as we get towards our reactors, we tend to taper our aeration down at the back end of the reactor before it discharges so we don't have a lot of excess oxygen. It's going to go into the clarifier and then ultimately come back uh, and recycle, or it's part of that recycle stream. We want to keep that as low as possible. Here you can see the uh, parabolic mixer that they use in these anoxic zones now. Well, you can just drop in any old kind of mixer. You can do a lot of uh, relatively low uh, cost adjustments to your existing processes to accommodate nitrification, denitrification. Again, selector zones, you use plywood, you've got some metal corrugated walls here that they can throw up just to help separate those sections from the aerated part of the tank. So that's kind of a quickie of the nitrogen process, how we remove it. Any questions? We doing good? Any questions in the room? Did that explain the uh, improve the denitrification process? I feel like it did, but uh, Nick, if you want to follow up with another question, feel free to, to send it and we'll address it. All right. So again, those are relatively easy processes to develop and, and to install in a facility. Phosphorus removal, uh, unfortunately, goes a bit beyond that. We can do a very good job of biological phosphorus removal, but a very good job isn't sufficient anymore. Again, phosphorus impacts, uh, again, more eutrophication, we've got chlorophyll, you can see what's going in here. Phosphorus and sediment, particularly for farming communities, you get the heavy rains and a lot of the fertilizer and stuff washes uh, into the receiving streams and can cause quite an issue. Okay. Point sources, ideally, and this is where non-point source really affects us a lot. We're trying to make up for the non-point sources, essentially. Uh, but come from industrial facilities, municipal facilities, they're not controlled. Urban non-point sources, stormwater runoff, uh, rain, all that good stuff. <clears throat> you get farming 
golf courses. Uh, it really uh, add a lot to the process. So typically our phosphorus coming in is around 6 to 10 milligrams per liter, which doesn't sound like an awful lot, but it still has quite an impact. Human waste detergents, corrosion inhibitors. Our phosphates are used by the uh, drinking water people to preserve their pipes. So now we've got to deal with it afterwards. And orthophosphates, polyphosphates, some organics in there. Again, the limits are going down, down, and more down all the time. Uh, history around here, the Upper Blackstone uh, started to go through an upgrade for their facility based on permit numbers and of course upgrades take a number of years and they didn't complete that before the next permit came out. By the time they got the next permit, the number was even lower. So they had to scramble for even more updates before they finished the first one. Uh, the other thing that you'll see down the bottom corner here is they're also lowering limits on aluminum and iron, which is going to cause issues as far as phosphorus removal. <clears throat> Ideally, treat it at the source if you can. If you've got an industry that has phosphates in their water, we try to work with them to come up with something for a substitute to reduce the amount that comes in. Uh, again, drinking water systems have been adjusted uh, with different chemicals so that that wouldn't be a problem. We can do a very good job biologically. We can get down below one reasonably well and consistently. But again, now we're looking at 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, crazy low numbers. So we have to go in with chemicals. So the phosphorus that we're dealing with, primarily orthophosphate, and we've got organisms out there that can store this stuff. These are xenobacters. They can take a higher level. So we're going to play with them to make them do that. We refer to them as poly B bacteria. They'll actually suck up excess phosphorus under the right condition. So again, our sludge, when we waste it, is typically about 2% phosphorus. In it. We know what's going on. What we're going to do is we're going to mess with these organisms so they pull up that excess phosphorus. And when we waste them, they're actually about 6%. That's how we're going to remove this actually goes out with the sludge. Well, as a result of that, now that any organisms that we have uh, have extra phosphorus in it, if we have issues with our clarifier and our suspended solids and our waste go out, now we're going to have elevated phosphorus because now they have triple the amount of phosphorus that we would normally have under those conditions. A different thing here. So again, we've got these organisms that uh, will store this excess stuff, and we're going to put them into an anaerobic zone. That's why if you go back to that garden fall, the first thing that you see in the plant is an anaerobic zone. What happens is when they go into this anaerobic zone, there's no dissolved oxygen, there's no nitrites, nitrates, no sulfates, no CO2. There isn't an O to be found in that tank. So it scares the devil out of them. They just dump phosphorus out of their body. Make whatever analogy you want. <laughs> they just dump it out. So if you were to look at the phosphorus in your wastewater, it would actually go up in that anaerobic zone because they're dumping it out of their body. So fine, we've got a bunch of bugs that have just dumped all their phosphorus out. They're starved for oxygen and they're looking for something. And we've got heterotrophic bacteria in there again. We've got our biodegradable carbon coming in, it's our primary effluent. We're going to get these guys to, uh, when they go in there, they dump this stuff out, they release phosphorus, magnesium, potassium. Get about that PHB stuff. And then when they go into the oxic zone, when, well, actually, the next step is an anoxic zone, this oxygen there. So this is where they'll start to actually pick this back up. Very selective, they outpace the other ones, they start to uptake soluble phosphorus. And they're going to start storing it for fear that they're going to be in that situation again. Again, if you look at the water side of things, uh, we come into our tank, anaerobic, they dump all that phosphorus out. So the phosphorus content in the water goes up dramatically. And 
then once they start to see oxygen of any sort, they start to reuptake that phosphorus again and excess. So then your phosphorus level in the water drops down dramatically, comes back down again. They go from originally being 2% phosphorus, now they're 5 and 6% phosphorus. So again, anaerobic, that's their phosphate release. Once they start to see oxygen of any sort, they start uptating phosphorus. And we put them in the clarifier and we waste them out at three times the normal level. That's the whole process behind biological phosphorus removal. Again, we have to build our selectors again. We're going to have no aeration. We're not going to have any return, well, we'll have return sludge come back in because we need the bugs to do the job. We're going to make sure there's no nitrate. You see our return stream from the reactor still stays in the anoxic zone, which is downstream of the anaerobic. No extra oxygen brought in. This is where they're going to do their uptake in the aerobic zone. Okay. If you go back to the five-stage Bardenfo, and this is where upper Blackstone is starting to head. We're going to come into our plant. We're doing nitrogen and phosphorus removal through this process. We hit the anaerobic zone. The organisms dump their phosphorus out. Nothing's happening as far as nitrogen goes. We go into the anoxic zone. Here's where we've got our re nitrate-rich re recycle. comes in here. We're going to lose our nitrogen from the anoxic zone, and the organisms start to pick up the phosphorus. We go through our aerated zone, the oxic zone. Here's where we're nitrifying, taking the ammonium nitrogen, breaking it into nitrates to be sent back to the anoxic. We're still uptaking phosphorus at this level. We're going to go into another anoxic zone. We're going to redo the whole nitrification, denitrification process here with some carbon addition. Make sure we have ample supply to keep the bugs fed. Go into our clarifier, pull our sludge out, rich with phosphorus. The nitrogen went away in the two anoxic zones. Hopefully we're down around 0.5 milligrams per liter of phosphorus. That's just biologically. And the only compounds or chemicals we had to worry about was making sure we had sufficient alkalinity through the process for the nitrification and we're going to add some carbon of some sort. And there's various iterations of those processes. And SBR, again, by working your cycles in a certain way, you can come in, you can be anaerobic for a while, phosphorus release, and then you aerate, and you've got your uptake. It's kind of a deal. SBR up in South Berwick, Maine. But again, 0.5 is not sufficient for the current limits. Right now, Upper Blackstone's at 0.2 and they're being pushed towards 0.1. And the other thing that burns them is it's based on a 90-day rolling average. You know what a 90-day rolling average means? 90-day rolling averages. I'm going to collect data for 90 days, and I take an average. On the 91st day, I get a new piece of data. I throw out day one, and I add day 91, and I've still got 90 days of average. So you can do very, very well up until, like, day 87, and then you have a bad day. Now you get this big number, and it doesn't take much to really skew that number. Now you're going to live with that bad number for another 89 days. You just can't shake it. So you... You're up against the wall all the time in a system like that. So to get below 0.5 on a consistent, regular basis, we now have to go to chemicals. What we're going to do is we're going to form an insoluble precipitate, a phosphate flock. We're going to react the phosphorus with a chemical, form a phosphate flock. Then we have to take that flock out of the process. Chemicals that are typically used are alum, aluminum sulfate, Sodium aluminate, a little more expensive, works very well. Uh, polyaluminum chloride is probably the most common. It's relatively easy to work with, not horribly expensive. And ferric chloride is the one everybody tries to avoid at all costs. The problem is, 
aluminum limit. Aluminum limits in this part of the country pretty much break our back because our background aluminum is so high. So you're pretty much eliminated from using them. Upper Blackstone can't go with aluminum. They have an aluminum limit, so they have to use ferric chloride. Ferric chloride is a byproduct, or used to be a byproduct of the steel industry. But the steel industry is where now? It's gone to China. It's gone overseas. So this stuff is not readily available, so now they actually have to manufacture this stuff. It was relatively inexpensive and pretty consistent. Now they're manufacturing it in a variety of ways, so we're getting strange metals and things in there. And it's just a miserable stuff to work with. It's very corrosive, it's nasty. Anyways, our phosphate block, how do we remove solids in our process? Generally through our clarifiers. But it's a very fine flock and it's hard to settle up. So what we'll find in a lot of these processes now is filtration as a tertiary treatment. So chemical removal is a lot of different. There's single point, there's multi-point uh, addition. Uh, and here's where uh, some plants uh, can kind of get in trouble. They will add some before their primary. So what will take it out for our primary settlers? But if they add too much, they've removed all of the phosphorus from their stream, and now they don't have what they need to keep the bugs happy. So you got to be careful as to how much you put in and where you put it in. We're forming this uh, metal ion that's going to settle out. Insoluble metal phosphate, it could be aluminum phosphate, ferric phosphate, it's going to come out in our sludge. Again, now we're adding a lot of material. We're using lime for precipitation, one and a half times total alkalinity, aluminum, 0.87 pounds, iron, 1.8 pounds per pound. pHs have to be carefully watched because. These materials are uh, all over the place with their pHs. Yeah. They work fairly well with simultaneous precipitation. We can settle it out with our organisms relatively well, but it doesn't always quite get you where you need to be, particularly with some of the low numbers we have. Again, dosage will depend on how much phosphorus you have coming in. Iron salts, these are all available. Again, the most common is ferric chloride, pretty nasty stuff. Aluminum sulfate, these are the preferred method. Aluminum is a lot easier to work with. But again, if we have a limit, that's going to restrict us. Multipoint tends to be the best way to go when you look at the process. You can do it in one spot, but uh, again, we can add a little bit before our primary clarifier, take some out there, add some before our secondary. And certainly, if you're doing filtration, you may have to have a third spot. And if you look at the difference between single point and triple point, uh, the actual dosage overall is a whole lot less, essentially 50% by taking it out over three phases rather than trying to get it all at once. It requires a lot of jar testing, a lot of monitoring on a regular basis as to what's going on. If we take it out in our primary, it can help our suspended solids removal. But again, you have to be careful about causing phosphorus deficiency. You don't want to shorten the bugs on what they're going to get. You can also consume some of that alkalinity that's coming into the plant because these are acidic streams. They're pretty low pH, about 3.5 for the ferric chloride coming. Same thing with the alum. So it's going to consume some alkalinity, so we may need to supplement that after the process. Secondary clarifier. You get a high level of removal, particularly when used with biological phosphorus removal. Works out pretty well. And here's the concern with our effluent. With the uh, higher level of phosphorus in your sludge, or in your uh, effluent solids, if you're at a 0.2 limit, uh, let's see, you'd have to be down, you'd have to have Suspended solids uh, below three on your effluent stream, which is pretty darn tight. For your typical stuff, you way out here somewhere before you have to worry about the phosphorus content. Any typical stuff. So, becomes a concern, which is why most of these facilities 
now go to tertiary filters after the secondary clarifier to make sure we remove any of that phosphate flock that's still in the system. Didn't want to settle out. And we've got all different types of filters. We've got deep bed filters. We've got automatic backwash. We've got cloth filters. Uh, a lot of new stuff coming out all the time now because it's become a very pressing problem. Yeah, we've got automatic sand filters. We've got disc filters. It's, uh, all kinds of variations out there. Gravity filters through sand or a mixed media like this one shows with anthracite and sand. The continuous sand filters. One uh, manufacturer that produces these, it uh, continuously filters and continuously washes the sand. The sand is actually continually flowing uh, through a process. So they don't have to take it offline to clean it up. That's the flyover for phosphorus. Uh, I do want to go over one thing before we take a break here before we do solid handling. Just give you some ideas the impact uh, that these low numbers have, and kind of arguing for the, the wastewater crowd that uh, feel kind of put upon taking the burden of all this stuff, but. Uh, let's see, this is from uh, Upper Blackstone. In order to achieve the 2008 permit, let's see, they were converting to uh, a Barden Pope process for their nitrogen removal. They needed additional aeration, methanol additions, so that's an expense there, uh, high rate clarification or filtration for the phosphorus numbers. But here's, here's the thing that really gets an impact. In order to do it, uh, on a yearly basis, they'll have to bring in 8,100,000 gallons of sodium hydroxide to control their alkalinity. They'll be consuming 3 million kilowatt hours more electricity annually. They'll have uh, 20,600,000 more cubic feet of natural gas they'll be burning in their incinerator. Uh, 1.8 million gallons of ferric chloride will have to be trucked into that plant. You know how many trucks a day that's going to be. And they're going to consume 150,000 gallons of methanol. And I think I did a quick calculation. It probably removes about 100 pounds of phosphorus a day. A lot of money per pound when you get down to it. But. What's the question? What's that? They're at point two now, being pushed to point one. How much water do they treat a day? Uh, normal days are around 30 million. They have the capacity to go over 100. And the thing is, they, they fought this whole thing for years. Between the upper Blackstone plant in Narragansett Bay, where it eventually discharges, it's 19 impoundments. And when they did the river study, essentially, if they went to zero phosphorus, it'll probably take 50 years before you see zero down at the other end because of all the stuff in the cylinder. But those are those those are the challenges we have now. Do you have any questions, Bruce? Not at the moment. There's anybody out there? Take a break. Take us a break then. All right, we'll be back. Ten minutes. In ten minutes at ten forty. <sighs> All right, everybody, welcome back. We're going to go ahead and get started with uh, solid handling. Okay. So we're done with the water side of things. It's all nice and clean and thrown in the river or wherever it's going to go. Now we have to deal with all of the stuff that's been removed from that water that came in the front door. And that's where our solids handling comes into play. Again, everything that came in is now being removed as sludge. We took out sludge. Uh, 
first things we removed were in preliminary treatment. We took out screenings. We sent that to a landfill. We took out grit. That went to a landfill. Now all of the uh, particulate and soluble BOD that came in, along with any other colloidal material that wouldn't uh, be caught in preliminary treatment, has to be dealt with. And it's all been removed through I2 clarifiers, primary and secondary. Now, the material that comes out of a primary clarifier is probably about one and a half to two percent solids. Might be a little more depending on how your process runs. The material coming out of a secondary clarifier is typically 0.5, 0 0.6 percent solids. Very dilute streams. If we were to go to a landfill with this material, we have to have a minimum of 20 percent solids. So we've got to squeeze a lot of water out of this stuff before we can even get rid of it. If we're going to incinerate it, we have to squeeze a lot of water out of it because we don't want to be throwing water on a fire. It doesn't work well. So this is a very physical uh, type of an operation from here on out. It is enhanced with chemical addition, though, as we're going to see. So again, we, uh, in order to deal with uh, solids handling, our primary purpose is to reduce the volume of material we're going to dispose of. This comes in handy because most small facilities, a million gallons or less, a couple million gallons or less, will generally go through one step of the process and then ship it to a large facility to be completed. Because the amount of the equipment, the expense of maintaining that equipment just isn't justifiable for the small rates that they have. So we want to reduce the amount we're going to throw in a truck to ship someplace else, save on shipping costs. Uh, we need to prepare our solids for disposal. Uh, landfills, again, have certain prerequisites for anything that goes in, so we have to be able to meet those in terms of solids, vector attraction, and some other things, which are the third items that we're looking at. When we come into the plant, Typically, if you've been to a facility, the headworks building where the water first comes in is one of the smelly parts. Solids handling is the other one. Everywhere in between is not bad, but these two ends uh, can be kind of rough. This particular chart shows pretty much all of the uh, options we have for disposing of solids that come into the treatment plant. Again, screenings and grit, we're dewashing, uh, we're washing, we're dewatering. To a certain degree, that can just go off to a landfill without too much difficulty. Scum and solids from primary and secondary and any other tertiary filtration that we may have all have to be dealt with in much more complicated fashions. So we break it down into a number of steps. Uh, facilities may use all of these or some portion of these. Uh, conditioning, as it indicates, is preparation. These solids uh, don't dewater quite easily on their own, so typically we're going to add some chemical of some sort to facilitate the separation of the solids from the water. We call that conditioning. Thickening is probably the minimum process that any facility will do. We're going to take our blend of material that might be one percentage in terms of solids. Now we want to get it up to something reasonably truckable, five, six, seven percent still pumpable but we want to send it to somebody else, so it's a lot less water to ship. Stabilization is a term of uh, preparation for disposal. Uh, the one that you're probably more familiar with is anaerobic digestion, most common method of stabilization that we use. And then dewatering is the final step before we go to a landfill or maybe we'll send it to an incinerator or some other material. That's where we get it up above that 20% solids rate, we're going to squeeze the rest of that water off. Too difficult to do in one shot, so we go through these various steps. Uh, again, we have incineration as a possibility for disposing of this material, landfills, uh, what we call beneficial reuse, composting, or land application. Chemical conditioning is pre treating the sludge in order to get it to separate better from the water. Again, these particles that we have tend to have uh, an electric charge to them. It tends to be a negative charge. And what it does is it's like two magnets of the same polarity. If they all have the same charge, they don't want to go near each other, so they're repelling. We have to break that electric bond there, stabilize it to some degree. So we're going to use some uh, chemicals to do that. For a long time, inorganic salts were 
the way to go. A lot of plants still use these. These uh, might be familiar because we saw these in the phosphorus removal. Aluminum sulfate, very common. Ferric chloride, calcium hydroxide or lime work very well. Part of the problem is they're inorganic salts. You're adding a fair amount of weight to sludge you already got to pay to get rid of. Uh, they're acidic streams, they're nasty streams, which be uh, quite problematic. Particularly if you're running an incinerator, it could be uh, an issue with the type of sludge it goes in. Most commonly now, we use organic polyelectrolytes, polymers, big, long chain organic molecules. When you put them in, you add virtually no weight at all. And they really are, yeah, I've worked with these over a number of years in various applications. It's like flipping a light switch, night and day difference between when it's there and when it's not. Uh, you can buy positive charge, negative charge, you can get no charge, you get different charge densities, you get different molecular weights. Uh, molecular weights start at about 100,000 grams per mole, run upwards of 10 million. Huge, huge molecules. They work really, really well. You can buy dry material, you can buy liquid, uh, really good stuff. Uh, it's expensive though, but you don't need much of it. You use fractional percentages in your solutions. Uh, dry material can be bought, but it needs to be mix, mixed properly. These polymers are strange uh, type of chemicals. Uh, they like water and yet they don't dissolve well. You had a handful of, uh, or a cup of uh, dry powder and you threw some water in there, uh, all you'd get is a big jelly mass on the top. It wouldn't soak in, it wouldn't dissolve anything. So you, you really need the right equipment for it to work. And it needs to cure for at least an hour or two to really hydrate the molecule properly. You can buy it in a concentrated form, but you have to make it down. You have to dilute it with water before you use it. And again, still need some curing time after that's done. Or you can buy a straight solution. You bring in a 250-gallon tote, just hook up your pump and let it run away. So, it's great stuff. You can see the type of uh, mixing operations that they have. And typically, we'll only make up what we call a day tank. We only want enough for a couple of three shifts because it degrades with time and temperature. A UV light can, can hamper it. And it's fairly expensive stuff. It's, you know, $15, $20, $25 dollars a pound. So you don't want to be wasting it. Your typical setup where you mix it up and then throw it down to a holding tank before it's used. Uh, here's one particular device for uh, mixing dry polymer with uh, the water so you get the proper solutions. Cell thickening. First step that the sludge will uh, encounter after it's left your clarifiers, you get into some blending operations. But uh, again, we're reducing the volume, we're getting rid of some of that water. If we go from 1 to 2 percent up to 5 to 6 percent, we've removed a lot of water. Cut that volume down to about a third. Uh, various methods, gravity thickeners, dissolved air flotation, centrifuges, uh, drum thickeners, there's new stuff coming out all the time. Uh, again, when you look at the difference, the amount of water that sludge will bring, secondary sludge carries a lot of water. It's very light, it's just a bunch of organisms. No real mass to it all. So again, by reducing the uh, volume, you know, we've got a digester, it'll work better with less water, less water to heat. Again, if I'm setting it somewhere else, fewer trucks have to leave the plant every day. So, gravity thickener. Gravity thickener is essentially a clarifier. Dimensions are somewhat different from the ones we've seen previously. But it's got a very long detention time in it, upwards of a couple of days. And our sludge will concentrate in the bottom like it does in the other clarifiers. But we'll get up to 4 to 9 percent. We're going to add some polymer in there to facilitate the settling of this material. Now, the effluent from this thing, we're going to be taking water off, so the water comes out and has to go back into the process someplace. It's generally prior to our primary clarifiers. And take a look at that effluent stream in terms of solids coming out. 350 milligrams per liter. It's pretty dirty stuff. So these streams that we're going to get out of solids handling all come back into the process, back towards the front end, and can complicate the way things operate, depending on when you run it and how well these systems are running, too. So. That's way more solids than you would find in your typical influent wastewater stream. That's going to come back to you. Here's the drawing of one. Again, it's, it's like a circular clarifier. The dim, uh, dimensions of the diameter in proportion to the depth of the tank are quite different from your typical clarifier, which would have a much greater diameter. You'll also see a difference in that the rake mechanism 
is considerably different from what you'll find in a typical circular clarifier. You see all of these upright rods, what we'll call fingers or pickets. The reason for these is we've got solids that we've taken out of a clarifier. Remember, the stuff sat in a clarifier for some amount of time. The water's in two to three hours. The sludge stays considerably longer. All oxygen is pretty much gone at this point. And we get into that concern about are we going to generate some gases like nitrogen or hydrogen sulfide or methane that's going to pop that sludge. Well, we're sending that material into this thickener now, and it's going to sit there for upwards of a couple of days. There's no aeration involved. There's still some food. There's bugs, because that's what the sludge is. They're going to break this down and generate hydrogen sulfide, methane gas, maybe some nitrogen might come out of it. If we don't do something to release those gases, this stuff's going to pop, and the idea is to concentrate it on the bottom of the tank. So as this rake mechanism turns and those pickets work through the sludge blanket, they spread the sludge apart so that the gas bubbles can rise to the surface without taking a big blob of sludge root. Keep things concentrated down at the bottom. Most of these, uh, unlike these here, particularly in this part of the country, will be covered. Because again, it's sitting there for a couple of days. You can imagine how lovely that's going to smell after it's sitting around for some amount of times. High concentration of H2S and, and methane in there. Uh, that's what they look like. That one in the upper left there, the uh, blue catwalk, you can see the picket structure down in the bottom portion of it there to help uh, get those gas bubbles out of the unit. They work quite well. Dissolved air flotation has been a popular method of thickening for a long time. Again, this time we've got a rectangular clarifier, but instead of settling, we actually want to float this material. So I'm going to jump ahead. There. You've got some trouble. We've got a recycle stream in here. We've got a tank. We're going to put some air pressure on, and these are controlled by air to solids ratio. But again, we can get up with 6 7% uh, solids concentrated in these 50 50 with our preliminary and secondary. So if you look at this tank, it's a rectangular tank. We're going to come in. Hey, it works. There's our sludge source coming in. We're going to add some polymer to this in all probability. It goes into the tank. The water's going to pass through. The idea is we're going to float our sludge to the surface here. The water's going to pass under a baffle and then leave as relatively clean sub -neat coming off the bottom and pass away. Now, what makes this system work is, let's say, for argument, I've got 100 gallons a minute sludge source coming in. I'm going to leave with 100 gallons a minute of water. But what I've got is I've got this recycle stream that we see pulling off from the uh, subnatant line and pumps into this tank. I'm going to have 50 to 70 PSI of air pressure in the headspace of that tank. And what I'm doing is forcing air into solution. And I'm going to keep that water under pressure until it joins the incoming sludge stream right at the back of the tank. Once I release the pressure on that line, it's just like you taking a bottle of club soda on a summer afternoon after it's been sitting on the picnic table and taking that cap off. That's got carbon dioxide under pressure in solution. You look at it when the cap's on, it just looks like plain water. Same with this. Once you take that pressure off, that stuff can no longer stay in solution. Atmospheric pressure, it's going to come up. And properly done, it comes out in a zillion tiny microscopic air bubbles, attaches to the flock, and forces it to rise to the surface. And what we do is we keep what we call a blanket of sludge at the top of that tank. As the material comes up and accumulates, the air bubbles keep trying to release through that sludge blanket, and compress it, and help dewater it to some degree. So we'll keep four to six inches of sludge at the top. You've got a chain and flight scraper that'll start removing on a regular basis. And it concentrates up to about five to seven percent solids. Works quite well. And you can see, pretty thick, uh, kind of in the consistency of a chocolate mousse. If you want to think of it in those terms. Uh, but yeah, you know, something you could throw in a tank, send to somebody else, let them deal with it. Works quite well. But all that is is, you know, huge number of organisms all just bound together. Again, uh, the big secret to working so well is that polymer that we use. A gravity belt thickener is a very simplified way to thicken your sludge. It's just gravity drainage through a belt, filter belt, 
We're going to add some polymer, and we control the thickness by our belt speed. Again, 4 to 6 percent solids. Uh, we've got a drawing here. Again, we take our conditioned sludge, lay it on top of this belt, and the water just drains by gravity. Uh, you'll see this indication of plows, or plows or chicanes. They're just kind of like paddles in there that keep spreading the sludge from side to side so the water has access to the belt so it can drain better. The belt gets washed as it comes back around, try to keep it clean. It works very well. Uh, this is the one out at uh, Amherst Baths, and there's their polymer conditioning tank. Polymer will be addition. Sludge comes up and just slides down this ramp onto the belt. This white piping on the bottom side as the uh, backwash lines to uh, to spray water on to keep the belt from blinding, and all of the filtrate that's collected in this sump underneath the unit. And that's kind of what it looks like when it's running. These, you can see these are triangular shaped plows. The sludge will hit that, get spread apart, allows the water access to drain through the belt, to get more drainage all the way through. Nice, simple, easy to operate type of a system. Rotary drum thickener. We might have seen something like this in preliminary treatment. It's just a big rotating drum with a mesh screen on it. And depending on your porosity, it depends on how tight your filtration is going to be. Uh, sludge is pumped into this as this thing rotates. Sludge keeps moving forward. The water passes on through and comes away. You see an auger built in there to help keep the solids moving forward to the discharge point. Uh, Merrimack, New Hampshire got rid of their dissolved air flotation unit and replaced it with two of these. A lot less complicated. Yeah, that's a pretty good job of concentrating solids. Stabilization is something that usually comes in after thickening. Uh, and again, what we're going to do is make a stable sludge. Right to this point, it's going to smell kind of badly. Stabilization will convert it into a non odorous sludge that can stand for some amount of time. Does a good job of breaking down pathogens, reduces insect attraction, improves the next phase of the operation. Again, stabilization, typical methods are anaerobic digestion, aerobic digestion, or chemical treatment. Again, typically, we take a blend from our primary and our secondary, put them in these units. And we're going to take it from a nasty, Smelly, sticky kind of a substance to make it odor free and easy to dispose of. Again, anaerobic digestion in this part of the country is the more common. Uh, there's not a lot of digesters around, but particularly here in Massachusetts. Vermont seems to like it quite a bit. And basically, we are going to intentionally have an anaerobic system. We don't want any air of any sort, and it's basically a two phase operation. Overall, it takes about a month to complete the whole thing. We've got what's called acid formation. We're going to take our sludge in, and this is, if we call that endogenous phase of their life, where we don't have any food, so they just turn on each other and themselves as a food source. Well, that's what happens. The steel cage match. You throw them in a tank with no additional food, leave them there for 30 days, and you see who comes out. We're going to reduce the volatile content of this material by about 50%. It's a great reduction. First process is the organisms got some acid formers in there. They're going to break down this material into organic acids, fatty acids. Then we've got another set of organisms, or organisms called the methane formers, that take these fatty acids, break them down into methane, CO2, hydrogen sulfide, and water. So we've got the saprophytic organisms, the acid formers. Convert the volatile organic matter into volatile acids. A couple of basic ones, acetic and propionic acids, pretty common. Then the methane fermenters. Make methane, carbon dioxide, and water. So again, we started out with a bunch of bugs, ended up with a couple of gases and some more water. Not a bad deal. So again, we've got a 50 to 60 percent reduction in volatiles. It's a very, very sensitive operation. Very good mixing. Uh, the alkalinity to acid ratio is very critical to the system. And temperature is very, very, very tight band. So, and the thing that we have to be concerned with is the methane fermenters are the slow people. 
So you can feed this thing fairly quickly and the saprophytics will break things down into the volatile acids quite readily. But if you can't convert that into methane, then you're gonna have an issue. That ratio is gonna get skewed and it's basically the same as you guys having an upset stomach. And you just can't throw a couple of tums in there to fix it. You've gotta correct that ratio. So, uh, you can do it in cold temperatures, 50 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, but it takes a long time. It's not practical, we'd have huge tanks, doesn't work. The mesophilic bacteria, the mid-temperature range, those are the most common. 85 to 100 degrees of range, but most of them you'll find are 95 to 97 degrees. Very much like our stomachs. 25 to 30 days, this is the most practical method. You don't have to heat it quite so much. Again, very temperature sensitive. We don't want this varying one degree, one direction or the other from that band. Good mixing to make sure everybody's getting churned up in there, the right pHs, and watching that acid to alkalinity ratio. So that means we want to watch that in order to determine how fast we want to feed this thing. If that number gets skewed, we've got to cut back on our feeding, let it mix, and let the other guys catch up. It can be done at a high temperature. There's uh, some facility, I can't remember who it is, is starting up a thermophilic uh, digester. Uh, but it's more heating requirement, but it is much faster, five to 12 days, but a lot of other issues going on with it. This is a drawing of the old style of two-stage anaerobic digester. Uh, what you've got is two tanks. The first tank is uh, where we're gonna form our volatile acids. It's a fixed tank, it's just a standard tank. It's got a kind of a conical bottom to it and it's various means of mixing this material. The second tank in this particular drawing is where the gas is gonna be generated. So in order to accommodate the volume of gas being generated and not have any pressure problems, it actually has a floating head to it. The weight of that head determines what the pressure is gonna be in that tank. It's always gonna be consistent, it just goes up and down depending on the amount of volume of gas you produce. So you don't have to worry about it. The issue being that as the head goes up and down, all of the attached piping has joints and stuff like that that'll wear away and leak. We're dealing with methane gas. These things have been known to go boom. So you gotta be very careful around these things. This is the prescribed design these days. This is the modern design for anaerobic digester. Uh, this is up in Nashua. The green tank, egg-shaped tank, and you'll find these out on Deer Island too, is the primary digester. The pink tank on the left is the second stage. That's where the methane's gonna be for. Uh, the reason they like this particular design, because it is shaped like an egg. There are no dead corners or flat spots like we had in the earlier designs. You've got very good mixing. Uh, there are some facilities, in fact, uh, Gorelick Farms. Gorelick Farms uh, does anaerobic digestion to reduce the amount of BOD they have before discharging to the treatment plant because what they have is way too high for them to deal with. So they gotta get it down to about three to 400 before they can discharge. And they'll use this bladder type of uh, digester. The bladder just goes up and down with the amount of gas being produced. Uh, they got two facilities that operate, both in Lynn down in uh, Franklin also. The, the methane form is a limiting part of the process. So you gotta watch how they're doing. If they're too slow, then you gotta back off so things uh, catch up with it. Temperature is very, very critical. Got to be careful with this. So. And yeah, we're generating methane gas. So a lot of facilities will take the methane gas generated, use it to maintain the temperature in the system. It's also being looked at. Still, be, I haven't heard anything lately that as a source of "quote unquote" clean energy. If you can believe it or not, using all of the food waste from large uh, industrial dischargers restaurants and schools and that sort of stuff, we into digester to generate methane gas to generate heat. The thing of it is, it's not the cleanest methane gas you ever saw, so there's a lot of issues with it. Uh, this is uh, the piping at the bottom of the unit up in Nashville. You can see how that comes down, much like an egg to the bottom. All of this piping that you see around there is just to help circulate the material to get the mixing that you need to get a really good digestion going. Here we go. And again, we have to heat it, so we're going to run this material through heat exchangers of various sorts. This is the one in Nashville, it's a spiral heat exchanger. 
got hot water in one end and sludge plastic through on the other side, maintain the temperatures properly. And it's a very thick material, so we're pumping things around with sludge pumps. These are piston pumps to help push that material around. We can't use that trip. Here's digesters up in Vermont, uh, the old uh, floating head type and the fixed type over there, the old style. This is Nashua. Yeah, this is now their second stage, even though we're producing a gas, does not have a floating head. Floating heads are, can be problematic, particularly in the climate up here. You get snow loads and stuff, and it just alters everything. Uh, what we have is very good and reliable pressure control valves on the top to maintain the kind of pressure that we're looking for. These type of devices. They don't have to have a floating head anymore. And Nashua at the time was flaring off, and most facilities you will find are flaring off their excess methane. Heat it off. But we do get some, because again, you get 8 to 12 cubic foot for every pound of volatile material added, and you get 12 to 18 for every pound destroyed. So you get a fair amount of gas off these things. Uh, but it's only about 65 to 70 percent methane. The rest is nasty stuff. Some ammonia, some hydrogen sulfide, some other organic materials in there. This material has to be cleaned up before you can use it in a decent burner. That's why most people just Burn it off, let it go. And the supernatant, we're going to let this stuff settle out, let the solids settle out, and then we're going to draw off the water. And again, that has to go back into the process and take a look at the solids and that supernatant coming out of there. That's pretty thick stuff. That, that's almost as bad as your secondary uh, sludge. And it can upset your alkalinity ratios when it comes back in. So it can be a concern. Can cause a problem for some of your BNR operations. But your digested sludge, if you're doing well, it's easily dewatered, has a mild odor, it's black and greeny, it's nice. If it's green and gray and stinky, then things aren't going well and you need to make some adjustments. All of Deer Island sludge is uh, uh, run through digesters. We can do the same thing aerobically. Again, it's just a matter of Keeping them aerated, they still are going to compete for each other for food. You're still going to get a good volatile reduction. But again, you're talking large tanks up here. From a temperature standpoint, it doesn't work very well because once you get down to about 50 degrees, it all stops. So that means you've got nothing all winter. Uh, we can do the other portions there. And you've got that additional load of aeration again. So, again, something more common down south, out where nobody can smell your operations. Chemical stabilization, uh, definitely something you don't see around here anymore. There used to be uh, chlorine stabilization, but that was just too nasty for anybody to deal with. That's gone. Lime stabilization uh, can be done. We're basically going to add lime to our sludge, anhydrous lime. And basically it's going to slake in that material. It's going to cook up like crazy. You've got to get the pH up to about 12 and maintain that for at least a couple hours. But It'll get hot as a pistol, it'll kill your pathogens. But again, look at how much we're adding. We're increasing our sludge load by 10% by adding all of this inorganic material. So it's, it's nothing you see around here. So now we're looking at squeezing the water out so we can finally get rid of this stuff. And basically, it's all a, a filtration process. There are centrifuges uh, that are very common out there also. Drying beds is something that's uh, not common in this region but it's available. Uh, recess cavity filters, very good uh, method. It's just brute force squeezing water out. What we've got is a, a series of uh, filter plates. It's called the recess cavities because they're machines so that when they come together, there's actually space between the plates inside. And we're going to load those up, and we're going to get these things up into the upper 20% range in terms of solids. Quite suitable for a landfill. Uh, there's a drawing of one again. These are what the plates look like, these two units on the bottom, rectangular plates made out of uh, polypropylene, material like that. And it's machined so that, again, when they put them together, there's a recessed cavity in between them. You have a cloth on each plate that acts as a, a filter medium. There's another small one. You see the piping on the, the right-hand side, that end is the fixed end. All the piping is attached to that. The center pipe is the feed. The four corners are for filtrate. On the far end is a ram. This one's a mechanical ram. Somebody has to crank that thing shut. 
Typically, you'll have a hydraulic ram in there that runs about six, 7,000 pounds to keep it closed, keep everything from squeezing out. And here's the plates again, the filter cloth. So when you look at it this way, we're going to pump our sludge into this. Again, this is thickened sludge. It's 5, 6, 7 percent solids. Uh, we're going to use a diaphragm pump, positive displacement pump, and fill this up. This brown section that you see here, uh, that's the cavity. We very quickly fill all of these cavities with the slurry. And at that point, we've got a positive displacement pump. It's going to keep pumping. So what it does is the pressure from this pump is, once this is full, it's going to push the water through the filter cloth. Uh, the way these machines are uh, machined, that water gets directed down to a hole that's going to bring it out the discharge end, and the solids stay inside. And it just keeps on pumping until you get to the point where those entire cavities are completely filled with solids. We run about 125, 130 pounds on the pump. Back it in pretty tightly. At that point, should shut down. These run automatically. They've got pressure switches. It'll run these things. Uh, some facilities will then blow air through the process to try to push more water out, uh, relieve pressure on the unit, take pressure off the rim, and then they'll spread these things apart. And I don't think we have a picture yet. And there's your filter cake that ideally is what you're going to see come out of there. Now you can take a piece of that filter cake, hold it in your hand, your hand won't even get damp. And it's only 25% solid. Great stuff. Squeeze the heck out of it, off to the landfill, everybody's happy. It's a batch process. You run as many cycles as you need to run. If you're a large facility and you run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because you're taking sludge from all the small guys, you're probably going to go with a belt filter press. See here. It's a continuous pressure filtration. Two belts, maybe three belts, there's different styles out there. And we keep increasing the pressure on the two belts as it works through a bunch of serpentine rollers. So we've got a polymer conditioning zone. Again, we have to condition our sludge with polymer. Then it goes to a gravity drain zone, much like that gravity thickener we saw earlier out from Amherst. Just let the water drain through with the chicanes and all. And then it goes between the two belts. And it keeps going over a series of rollers. And in each set of rollers, there's a hydraulic line that comes in to increase the pressure between the rollers. It keeps squeezing tighter and tighter as it passes through. And again, 25, 26, 28% solids. Again, good for a landfill, good for an incinerator, good for composting, whatever you want. Is it working? Ah, oh, it's not working. It should be running. <laughs> it normally animates. So there's your polymer conditioning. This top portion is just like the gravity uh, belt thickener. Got the plows, let the water drain through freely, and it goes between the belts again. This isn't quite correct because there's two rollers at each of these steps, and there's one that's got pressure lines on it, keeps squeezing between the two. Back at the far end here, before it discharges, it's hard to tell there's two belts, let alone two belts with solids in there. Once they separate, this material should slide right off. There you go. Uh, from a mechanical standpoint, as a beast, there's a lot of moving parts. These are the old units that have been replaced, since been replaced up at Upper Blackstone. Again, you can see all the rollers and lines and hydraulics and everything else. Here's the gravity drain zone. See a nice grainy appearance here, allowing the water to separate, drain through the belt, and then it goes through the thing. Your filtrate, like the other ones we've seen, is not drinking water. This is going back into your process. You see it down the trough at the bottom. Uh, you can see the black hoses for the hydraulic lines go into the rollers, keep the pressure on the unit. And there's your sludge cake just coming off the end. Both belts get washed before they come around to receive new sludge. And we've got what's called a doctor blade here along the edge to help peel off any uh, recalcitrant sludge that wants to stay on the belt. Shave it right off. It drops down. This one's going into a screw conveyor. It's going off somewhere for whatever purpose. Uh, this can be done in centrifuges, too. These are very common. Deer Island runs centrifuges. A lot of them do now. We use a lot of energy. <coughs> you can see at the bottom, operates up to 2,000 Gs, 2,000 times the force of gravity. Big boaters making a lot of noise. You can have a batch process with a solid bowl. <coughs> you can have a scroll, which is a continuous process. It too is a solid bowl. It's a different design. Uh, this is a, a cutaway of a solid bowl centrifuge, a batch process. <coughs> it's much like the basket inside your washing machine, except there's no holes in it. It's a solid wall. Uh, this 
thing's running at about 1,000 RPM. We're going to feed our thickened sludge into this, again, with some polymer feed there. And let's see. Boom. We look at it this way. The yellow represents the solids building up in the bowl. The red indicates the, the liquid portion. So the thing's at 1,000 RPM. When you spray this in, the solids being heavier than the liquid get thrown to the wall and get stuck there. We keep building up that layer. Very quickly, the uh, annular space fills up with liquid and it overflows the top of the basket and gets caught inside the housing, leaves as a, what we call a centrate. So that's leaving. We keep building up this layer of solids till it's just at a point where it's, we don't want the thick solids overflowing the basket. You could have a turbidity meter or something like that on the centrate line to say it's starting to get very dirty. We'll stop feeding. At this point, the machine's going to slow down to about 100 RPM. At 100 RPM, this is where they are, the hunks of steel. You can see this big blade here on the side. That is going to slowly cut in. It's kind of like peeling an apple. As the machine turns, it slowly starts peeling that sludge out of it, directs it down through holes in the bottom of the basket. Goes into a conveyor, a roll-off, what have you, and away it's gone. You need more, you run another batch. You run as many as you need, let's say. So it's good for a small facility that doesn't have to run continuously. Now these uh, horizontal scroll centrifuges, these are facilities, much like Deer Island, who run constantly on the dewatering process. What we've got is, is our drawing of it, a solid bowl is the housing out here. And you see the, uh, the solid bowl runs and it has a taper on the right hand side here where it gets narrow, angles down. That's the solid bowl that's going to be spinning about 1,000 RPM, 1,100. Inside that, we have a second unit, and what it has, it's called a scroll centrifuge because it has a scroll that's wrapped around it. So it's like a screw conveyor inside this spinning bowl. Now we're going to feed through the center of that inner portion. We're going to pump it in, and at that point, we've got openings to allow it to spread into the spinning outer bowl. Same process as before, the solids go to the bowl, liquids pull towards the center. Now what we have, the liquid discharges on the left-hand side of this drawing, and the solid comes out on the right-hand side after that taper. We have orifices on this liquid discharge to determine how deep the pool of water is going to be inside the bowl. And what it is, the deeper the pool, the better the separation between the liquid and the solid. Shallower the pool, not so much. So if you want a really clean liquid, you have a deep pool. So you've got good separation and clean liquid coming out on the liquid discharge. The trouble is, the deeper the pool, if we look at this taper, this inner portion, this scroll on the inside, runs at a slightly different speed, different RPM from the outer bowl. So it acts like a screw conveyor, pushing material towards the solid discharge. As the solids go up this taper, we call this the beach, at some point it comes out of the pool. And that allows us to dewater it and dry it. But the deeper the pool, the less beach I have for that to happen. So if I want a very clean liquid, I'm going to get a wet solid coming off. If I want a really dry solid, I'm going to have some solids in my liquid because the pool is shallower now. But I do have some amount of control over the differential speed, so I could have a fairly deep pool, but if this is moving slowly, I can still get a lot of good dewatering for the shorter version that's out of the uh, liquid pool itself. So you kind of work in that balance between wet solids and dirty liquid. All of these machines are extremely noisy. There's good reason that one of my ears doesn't work worth a hoot anymore. Is the solid bowl. You can see the taper at the far end uh, in the upper right hand corner there. The housing is open on that. Big hunks of steel that you don't want getting off on their own. Uh, that's that inner portion with the scroll on it. It worked very well. This is something, this is not new anymore. It's been around for about 20 years. This is a screw press. And uh, what we're doing in this one is We've got this uh, cylindrical section with screening on it. You can see the top portion here through that cutaway. But if you look at the internals, we've got a shaft that runs through it, and our sludge comes in at the uh, right-hand side, and it's a screw conveyor, but as it moves towards the discharge, the actual shaft of the conveyor itself gets larger and larger. 
So you're reducing the volume as you move towards there, and it forces the water out as it pushes it towards the discharge. Screw press. We're starting to see more of those these days. Uh, this is probably the newest of the bunch. It's the rotary screw press. Works on pretty much the same principle. We're going to have our feed come in here, and again, it just reduces the volume space inside that unit as it pushes the sludge through and just literally squeezes the water out of it. From a drying standpoint, drying beds are employed in some places. It's, uh, it's a great idea if you're in uh, West Texas or New Mexico or Arizona uh, because it's working outside. Basically, you take your thickened sludge and you pump it out into a big cement pad. Uh, you've got a cement pad, it's got a bit of a taper to it and a drain pipe at the center. On top of that, you lay down some gravel and then sand on top of that and you pump your sludge out on top of the sand and just let it slowly drain by gravity through the sand. Some of it, again, it works great in arid uh, areas because you evaporate a lot of your water too. And depending on how long you leave it out there, depends on what your solids content is when all is said and done. You actually add, you end up adding material, right? Because you're adding the sand and the gravel. You have to take all well, of it. Well, no, when, you, when you take it out, you just do a skim over the sand. You don't want to take a lot of it out. Uh, but again, we've got Organic matter, it's not disinfected, we have bugs, it's sitting out there just laying around so you can imagine it probably doesn't smell like a floral shop. So it's, again, great out in rural communities, not too good for uh, in town. Uh, this is how it works, again, you've got a layer of gravel and some sand on top, just lay it out there and let it drain. Let it drain, dry up in the sun, that's fine. And depending on how long you leave it there, it can get very, very dry, almost too dry, dusty. Uh, we can run it through mechanical dryers. Some uh, large municipalities do that before they get rid of their material. Uh, typical thing is just a big rotary dryer, rotary kiln. Our wet material is going to come in here on the uh, left-hand side. Typically, we'll mix it with some dry material to control moisture content. And uh, on the bottom right here, we're going to have our input of drying gases. Uh, it could be gas-fired. It could be uh, steam-heated air, whatever. But we have the Current, current flow, wet sludge coming from left to right, and hot gas going from right to left, and as it turns, it's, it's much like your clothes dryer. It's got something in there to help lift the material and have it drop through that hot air stream to help drive off the moisture. You can uh, run uh, your dryness up to uh, ridiculous amounts. Probably even start a fire if you're not careful. Now, composting. This comes under the category of beneficial reuse. We're going to a landfill, all we're doing is filling a big hole in the ground someplace. And that's getting more and more problematic because we're running out of land for landfills and they're getting fussy. So why just do that? Composting, we're actually going to put it into a beneficial use. Different ways of doing it, static pile, windrows, and mechanical. You stack pile in the top portion of that picture and the windrows down at the bottom is a windrow. Basically take your dewatered sludge and lay it out in a big windrow out in the field. Again, we've got organisms, we've got food, some moisture hopefully, uh, and this guy's going to go through once or twice a week with this uh, tractor unit to aerate the pile so that the organisms have oxygen to do their job. And it really cooks up pretty well. This is part of a uh, static pile composting unit. This uh, was in Bill Ricca, it no longer operates. Uh, they lay down a layer of uh, wood chips on the bottom, and then they take a blend of one-third dewatered sludge, one-third wood chips, one-third fly ash. Blend it up and then lay it down on top of this. The black pipe you see pumps air through the mass, provides the air for the uh, organisms. And you can see now it's all kind of charred looking from the temperature that it develops. You see a little bit of steam vapor rising from it if you look carefully. It'll sit there for about four weeks cooking up. And the temperatures are monitored and various other aspects are monitored during this whole time. It has to meet certain specs. At the end of the time, they would take it out and run it through the screening unit, that green beast in the background, to recover the wood chips. And this is the compost. It can be used for... I think they did class A, vegetable gardens, what have you. It's fertilizer. So 
we're actually putting it to a beneficial use rather than just filling a hole someplace in Western Mass or wherever it may be. All of the sludge from Deer Island, Deer Island's dealing with 350 to 400 million gallons on a normal day. All of their sludge gets mechanically composted. They do it inside like a manufacturing process. Uh, and then the theory is the bulk of that gets shipped down to Florida for their orange juice. Orange groves down there. You have juice this morning? Tastes like Roslindale? <laughs> yeah, more Hyde Park. <laughs> I know. So that's beneficial reuse. Now we talk about volume reduction. The ultimate volume reduction is incineration. This is organic matter. It burns. So we've got two methods of dealing with that. multi hot furnace, fluid bed incinerator. We're going to take our sludge through it, and then we're just going to get some basically inert material fly ash. multi hot furnace is uh, a big beast, big cylindrical unit with a number of layers inside. The term multi hearth one of the hearths. We're going to take our wet sludge, throw it in at the top, and break it down as it goes through this unit. These are running at 1,500 to 1,700 degrees. The first uh, three hearths, give or take, are mainly driving off moisture gets to a certain point, but then it actually combusts. So it helps burn itself as it goes through the cycle, then you have to cool it off before you discharge. Again, a little bit of fly ash going to the landfill. No vector concerns, no bacterial concerns. Good to go. Uh, this is a very simplified version of what, it's only five hearths in it. Wet sledge comes in, and you've got a big center shaft that runs through it with rake arms at every hearth to keep moving that material back and forth as it goes through the process. This is at Upper Blackstone. This is hearth number five. That is the sludge burning. That's not oil. That's not natural gas. That is the sludge on fire. But again, now you're not only uh, in the water business, now you've got air concerns to be worried about. You got knocks and socks and combustion management and all that fun stuff and particulates. This is a wet scrubber to make sure no particulate matter is going up the stack. You've got odor concerns. This is a, a screenshot from the incinerator that used to operate in Fitchburg, Mass. The nine hearth furnace. Uh, you can see a lot of temperature probes. There's a lot of stuff, and you don't even see a lot of the ancillary equipment that comes after this. Gas stream goes to a scrubber and various other things. Uh, they no longer operate this unit. They really didn't maintain it. It just fell into disrepair and they said the heck with it, and which was very difficult for a lot of other facilities that used to ship them sludge. A fluid bed incinerator is a somewhat simplified version of incineration compared to the multi heart. Uh, now I've got a big open tank, basically. And at the bottom of this, uh, I'm going to pump hot gases through the plate at the bottom of it, through hundreds of holes, and I've got a couple of feet of sand on top of it. If you look at that sand, that's where it gets its name. It looks like a fluid flowing around in that airstream. Again, running at 15, 1,700 degrees, somewhere in that vicinity. I basically spray my sludge into this tank. At 1,500 degrees, the water's gone in a heartbeat. The organics will burn up. Anything that hits the 1,500 degree sand is going to burn. The difference here, which makes this, even though it looks simpler, becomes complicated, is on the multi hot furnace, your fly ash comes out the bottom. On here, all of your fly ash goes out with the airstream. So now you have to have some method of separating that. You're going to go through cyclones. You're going to have a high temperature bag house to remove that material from it, and you still have all of the other combustion concerns to go with it, too. There's not a lot of these incinerators here in Massachusetts. Connecticut loves them for some crazy reason. It's the last place I would expect, but so be it. But ultimately, no matter what we do with these solids that came out of the process, it's all regulated by EPA under their Part 503 biosolids rule. If you're composting, it sets all of the conditions for Class A, Class B, Class C. Is it good for, you know? Get rid of that open pit mine next door, or can you use it on ball fields, or can I put it on my potatoes? All different types of parameters that you have to follow. It's very closely regulated. Uh, 
These facilities have to have their sludge analyzed on a regular basis. Uh, in Massachusetts, it's based on the tonnage that they develop. It might be simply monthly, it might be quarterly. Mine I only had to do once a year, which is good because it always scares the dickens out of me. You take your sludge, you send it off to a lab, and you get seven pages of material that they're testing for. Priority pollutants, uh, the metals, pesticides, and all sorts of crazy stuff I can't even pronounce, hexamethyl death. If any one of those doesn't meet the specs, then you're dealing with hazardous waste and paying tons of money to get rid of it. This is why the pre-treatment program is very important. See what those folks from industry are sending you, because if they send you something that shows up in your sludge, you can't get rid of it. You gotta chase them down and make them pay. There we go. Off to the landfill, Yahoo. Uh, surface application, not a common practice down below the uh, northern border of Massachusetts. They're very sophisticated down here. Uh, if you go up into Maine and New Hampshire, they'll take thickened sludge and just spray it out in the field. And plow it in on a regular basis. Fertilize, in fact, they do it with cow manure. Very common practice up north, in Maine too. Yeah, but that too, you know, has to be controlled by what's in your uh, sludge at any point in time. So I think, and okay. the, the concerns, again, that's why we have to treat our sludge in certain ways. They don't want excess water going to the landfill. They don't want odors and the vector attraction concern. Well, that's part of the issue that we deal with and get rid of our solids. So I believe that takes care of that portion. Questions? Um, yeah, so I just had a question about um, chlorine chemical stabilization. You said it was um, not that common. No one really does it anymore. Could you say more about it? Why right. that's the case? Well, it, uh, you think about it. You're going to take your sludge, you're going to react it with chlorine. Now you have the same kind of problem with the uh, lime sludge. What are you going to do with a 12 pH sludge? Who wants to take that stuff? Uh, the chlorine, in addition to just dealing with chlorine, uh, very problematic. You've got uh, exposure issues. You, the sludge itself is going to be very acidic when you get done with it. The moisture in the sludge and the chlorine are going to form hydrochloric acid, and it's just problematic in disposing of it. So you almost end up with a hazardous waste that you have to spend to get rid of. So. Tested your sludge and it came back and something was over. Yep. Um, there, it sounded like, are there avenues to try and find the source of that and maybe pursue? Oh, yeah. You have to. You have to. You have okay. to. Uh, you know, so it's not just your We're going to do a relatively quick overview of industrial waste treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, dry cleaner, I don't know if I already told you the story, dry cleaner up in Plymouth, New Hampshire, lost their dry cleaning fluid to the process and that made all of their sludge hazardous waste. Just by that, so yeah, and then he was on the hook, him and his mm -hmm. insurance company, for dealing with that material after that point. He had a pretty good fine, not to mention all the costs that he had involved in it, too. So. Jump right in and race through this? I think so. All right. Let's give you a little overview as to what happens uh, as far as industrial uh, waste treatment goes. Massachusetts is uh, somewhat unique from the other states in the region in that they have industrial waste water certification. If you're an industry and you discharge into the collection system, uh, you need to be permitted by the state, by the local facility. You need to have certified operators to operate this system. Uh, and certainly if you're an industry and you're a direct discharger, well, you fall under EPA and you've got your own NIPIS permit whole other ball of wax. But we have to do it because, uh, again, you go back to these slides. For years, the rivers were just dumping grounds, and uh, you may see that again real soon. Who knows? Uh, and industry just used them as a sewer. Everything got thrown out there. So, uh, again, the middle of the river out there, this is 1975, that's only four years ago, from industry situations like this to try to avoid. 
They throw acidic streams down there. The pipes would collapse and rot away. It's just not conducive to good operation. Uh, the thing I found surprising is clean water laws uh, actually started back in South Carolina, of all places, back in the 20s. And a number of other states have them too. But it wasn't because they were concerned about us, really. It was business was complaining. They wanted to use the river water in their processes, but it was too dirty. That's why they had any kind of clean water law. It was uh, business driven, not any environmental issues. And again, this is uh, all the amendments of the Federal Water Pollution Control Act. Again, originated in 47. 1972 was the Clean Water Act. But 77, 87, and 90, these were all largely directed towards uh, industry, those kind of things. So, again, they have to do it because, at a minimum, EPA requires them to. Done in 77, would don't interfere with the operation, don't have material that will pass through and end up in the uh, receiving waters, don't mess up the sludge. Those were the generals, and they went specific. Uh, we didn't want to blow up the sewers, like we saw from that Lexington issue there in 1980. We don't want anything corrosive that will ruin the collection system piping. No pH is less than 5. Nothing that will plug up the line. Solid and viscous pollutants that will choke things up and cause uh, sanitary sewer overflows. Again, nothing that will interfere or pass through. No high temperature stuff that will inhibit biological processes. Uh, again, here's the interference from large uh, Organic molecules that could just pass on through. Nothing that causes safety problems, generate uh, dangerous gases, and what have you, in the collection system or in the plant. And no midnight haulers, nobody dumping it where they're not supposed to go. But here's what uh, else they came up with. They said, well, they had a, apparently engineers were cheap back in those days, in the late 70s. So they took a bunch of them, locked them in their uh, little cubbies, and said, don't come out until you're done calculating. And they generated what we call categorical pretreatment standards, where they looked at industries and specific segments of industries and came up with numerical, economically, and technology achievable limits for these industries. We didn't rely on the locals coming up with the numbers. That this is what it's going to be. And it, you can see, well, it's partly off the wall here, uh, a long list of different industries. And if you look at them, a lot of them have as many as five different categories that you could fall into. My particular <coughs> operation is this one here. We pull up organic chemicals, plastics, and synthetic fibers. I'm not sure why, but that's what we ended up. And I can't remember which one of these numbers we fell on. But they lay out all of your limits. This is what you have. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. We don't care what the locals say. These are the minimums you're going to have. They could be concentration based, they can be mass based. It's very specific. The local authorities can be even tougher. You can always get tighter than the Fed, you can never get looser. So as you go towards Washington, the numbers get bigger. So and they came up, this term significant industrial user, if you're a significant industrial user, that means you are under closer scrutiny than the average industry. And to be an SIU, if you fall under one of those categorical standards, then automatically you fall into a significant industrial user category. If your flow is greater than 25,000 gallons a day, well, SIU. If you're greater than 5% of the hydraulic or organic loading on the POTW, you fall in there. Or if they just don't like you much. They say, hey, you got a chance to mess these things up. We're going to put you in this unit. Local regulations. Again, any pretreatment, any pretreatment, any plant with a greater than 5 MGD design flow has to have a pretreatment program. It's part of the NIFTES permits required. And if it's less than five, they can make you have one anyways, because there's somebody in your system that can really mess up your day. And you get to set numerical standards. This is, uh, where is this? I think this is Devon's. I forget. Uh, but this is the permit written by the local POTW. This is not EPA. This is not the state of Massachusetts. This is, uh, yeah, it is Devon's, out of Devon's. They wrote this permit for this 
They say what your level is going to be for the various pollutants, how you're going to sample it, and how often you're going to sample it. And if you look down here at the bottom, their pH. EPA says nothing below 5, has nothing on the top end. The state says nothing below 5.5, has nothing on the top end. But invariably, you'll find the locals will have, it is with 5.5 to 9.5, an upper limit onto their pH. The flow rate, how much they can do in the course of a day. All of these other parameters have to be looked at. Some are in concentration, some are in pounds per day, 200 pounds a day on nitrogen or phosphorus, 40 pounds a day. How often they're going to report, when they're going to do it, and what the dates are. Who they're going to report to, all of that good stuff. And then the signature line. I certify under penalty of law that this document, blah, blah, blah. We just got a report from uh, Jake here at EPA over a uh, fellow down in, I think it was New Jersey. He's going to jail. He's got a million dollar fine. He just refused to make the changes he was supposed to make. People go to jail over this stuff. Reduce user fees. By reducing your BOD levels of various other things, you might get a lower uh, rate on your sewer bill than other things. And you certainly don't want to be the, the bad guy in town. Again, we look at some of these categorical electroplating. Boom. These are the kind of pollutants that we deal with. Chemical manufacturing. It could be anything. Paper mills. Notoriously nutrient deficient. Talked about nitrogen for our bugs. You've got a paper mill in town. You may actually have to add nitrogen to your system to make your uh, organisms happy. Dairy processing. Now, in Massachusetts, while dairy processing is an industry, they would be certified under a municipal process because they are doing biological process, anaerobic digestion, to reduce their VOD. Feed processors, all of that stuff, circuit board manufacturers. That's the large reason why we have it here in Massachusetts. Back in the 80s, there was circuit board manufacturers in everybody's garage. Jewelry manufacturers. Pharmaceuticals, leather, everybody has my girl. <laughs> That'd get you through lunch, wouldn't it? <laughs> and these are the rigs here in Massachusetts to cover that sort of stuff. So again, as an industry, you can be a direct discharger, as we were up in Nashville. We'd have a NIPTES permit. We'd call it for that. You can be direct discharging to the POTW and be an indirect discharger. And if everything's fine, you don't have to do anything. Or in most cases, as we do here in Massachusetts, you're going to have to pre-treat to some degree, a minimum of pH control, and be an indirect discharger. Uh, but industrial treatments, a lot of different things. It can be very simple. It can be extremely complicated. It can be physical chemical. In Massachusetts, physical chemical is what we look at on an industrial certification. Or it could be a biological process, it could be on municipal side. Again, these folks would all be categorized as municipal operators because they're doing biological process. All of this, physical chemical, pretty much the rest of the crowd. So they go through preliminary treatment also and prepare it for further processing. Most people just stop at this point. We might equalize our streams if we've got a lot of different streams coming in. You want to design your plant so that you can run at a relatively constant flow, constant, dealing with constant uh, concentrations of pollutants and stuff. So if you've got varying streams around, throw them all into one big tank, blend it up so that you're dealing with something pretty steady. Different ways you can have one tank, you could have a side stream. Bring it into this tank, let everything blend out, and you've got one consistent stream coming out. Over here, if you get periodic dumps of either very high hydraulic flows or high concentrations, kick it off to the side into the equalization tank, and then just blend it back in so that it's not a big surge of either concentration or flow. Screening, they don't want to treat uh, solids any more than anybody else. We have to take it out. Very similar to what we saw in the municipal side. The tangential screen works very well. Uh, no moving parts to it, really. Vibratory screens. Pre-fed screen, internal fed screen. Similar devices to what we saw on the other side. Grid separation. Very common. 
here. We've got uh, done training for a company that makes abrasives. They have to separate all of their grit from their waste stream and run through cyclones. Oily waste, definitely want to get rid of that. We don't want to be sending oil to the POTW. We've got different types, free oils, emulsified and water soluble oils, and we have greases. You know, we get these by flotation or skimming. It's very simple to do. Grease falls into the same range. The little skimmer we've got is a, uh, a plastic tube, much like a Tigon tubing, but it has a particular affinity for oil. And we've got a little motor device up top, and it just keeps this thing rotating through. As it rides around on the surface of the tank, it picks up the oil, rides on up through in this picture on the right. A little wiper blade there that scrapes off the oil, gets dropped onto this little trough, and you can collect it in a 50-gallon drum or a 250 tote, whatever it may be, to remove the oil from your system. Uh, it's an API oil separator for larger systems. It's much like a clarifier. Uh, flow's going to come in, and we've got these uh, coalescing units in the center to help take all the small globs of oil and make larger ones so they float better. It works just like a clarifier. Or we could use a centrifuge if you wanted to. Emulsified oils. This is oil and water that uh, is kind of bound together. You've got to break that emulsion and treat up the oil. Steam and some polymers will do that for you. Once you do that, you can treat it like a regular free oil. And this is pretty much where most industries in this state will stop. pH adjustment. Just make sure it's between that 5.5 five to 9.5. Easiest thing going, kind of. You like pH. <clears throat> Yeah, typically, we're trying to get between 5 and 12, and the local permit will dictate what that's going to be. Uh, can improve things downstream if we're doing other stuff, reduces corrosion, yeah, neutralize acid, prevents corrosion, optimizes chemical reactions. That's very critical in uh, precipitation of metals and hexavalent chrome reduction and destroying cyanide. But uh, pretty simple stuff. Generally, we use in uh, Sodium hydroxide is probably the most common method of raising a pH in these systems. You can buy it in varying concentrations. It's easy to work with. Lime is strong. It's full of grit. It's dirty. Mag hydroxide works nicely. Again, you won't go over a 9 pH with that material. Uh, sodium carbonate, kind of weak stuff. It gives you a lot of control. We want to bring pHs down. Sulfuric acid is probably the most common. Hydrochloric. Pretty nasty stuff. Most people don't want to deal with it. Uh, you can actually take flue gas and bubble it through a water stream. Forms carbonic acid, and that's very weak acid for adjustment. So primarily, what we're looking at here is removing metals. The biggest concern, and we have to get this material out. So, again, but it comes from a, any number of places. Platers, chrome platers, circuit board manufacturers, galvanizing fence manufacturers, galvanizing fences, uh, metal pickling, photo processes, tanneries, various other spots, all kinds of sources out there. You have to deal with all of these types of things. You may have to deal with neutralizing acids. You've got uh, hydroxide precipitation of metals, sulfide not so common, oxidation of cyanide destruction. Cyanide baths are common in plating operations. Cyanide will kill you. You've got to take care of that problem. We have to reduce uh, hexavalent chrome. Hexavalent chrome is a carcinogen. So we have to reduce that down to trivalent chrome, which is a pretty innocuous chrome. Cyan exchange may come into play. There's a lot of different operations at the upper levels of this type of operation. Plating streams, we've got concentrated solutions, dilute rinse solutions. We've got chelating agents in there, which can inhibit uh, precipitation of metals. Uh, we deal with precious metals in a different fashion. And we've got those other units to deal with. A chelating agent is used in plating to hold metals into solution longer than they normally would so that they don't come out and ruin a plating operation. But in order to precipitate that metal later on, you have to break that bond. Otherwise, it's still not going to come out. So that could be a problem. But they're very common. These two items, again, cyanide and hexavalent chrome, nasty materials, uh, cyanide will kill you. And every now and then, there's, somebody dies because they didn't handle their cyanide properly. 
<clears throat> hexavalent chrome, again, is the uh, carcinogen problem that we have to remove by reducing that to trivalent chrome. You saw Erin uh, Brockovich, that's what she was dealing with that whole time out there, X chrome, different processes. But hydroxide precipitation is the most common method of removing metals from a process stream. These are solubilities of metals in solution, but these are ideal solutions. And so we're going to add sodium hydroxide to a solution of whatever these metals are, up to a certain pH, to get the minimum solubility that we're looking for, something that's below our permit level. So if you know what your permit level is, if it's 0.3, then you find out what pH you need to go through, and adjust your pH to that point, the material comes out of solution. And then we'll go through some other methods to remove it from the stream altogether. Part of the trick is, if you look at, like, chromium is the only one to really get concerned with, and zinc, uh, it actually resolubilizes as the pH goes up. So if we've got a couple of metals in there, we may not be able to get them all at the same pH. We have to remove the chrome first and then go after the nickel as a separate process altogether. So it can get complicated. So you find out the best pHs and you go after that. And you may have to do it in a couple of steps. And if you were to look at your process, that's what you'd see is you go from left to right, that bluish uh, material is your waste stream before treatment. You form your hydroxide, now you've got this cloudy water in the second beaker, then we add in some polymers, we go through coagulation. The next step, we get some good flock, then the, another polymer for flocculation, real heavy flock is starting to really separate with nice clear uh, supernatant. And run it through a filter or clarifier, and that beaker on the right is what you should have when all is said and done. X chrome, again, we have to treat that so that uh, no longer there. It's hexavalent chrome is the common method in chromic acid, so that has to be dealt with. And so what we're going to do is we're going to reduce that at a low pH. So again, pH becomes a critical part of all this. Uh, we're going to add some sulfuric acid and some sodium bisulfate. Those are reducing agents. We form chromic sulfate. You see down here in the bottom, that's chrome in the plus, six, uh, plus three form. And we got some residual salt and some water. We go to the next step. How'd that happen? Right. Go back with you. Okay. And then I can take this and use my hydroxide and precipitate out my chrome from that. We'll end up with some sodium salt as a solution. Cyanide, again, that has to be dealt with carefully. If your cyanide bath ever gets acidified, then cyanide gas will come out and it's not a good day. And I guess basically the gas chamber that you've just generated unintentionally. So we have to get that out of the water just to make sure we don't have any chance of that getting acidified anywhere. That's a two-stage operation. We use chlorine for that. Well, chlorine forms cyanogen chloride as an intermediate at a pH up around 11. And we'll react that with sodium hydroxide to form sodium cyanate. It's a very quick uh, chemical reaction right there. Then we can take our sodium cyanate and react that with sodium hydroxide and come up with removing our uh, just some nitrogen and carbon dioxide is what we end up with as an end result. So we start out with a deadly gas and end up with something very innocuous. Apparently I've lost a slide or two in that whole process. Jewelry manufacturers, we're dealing with expensive metals now, gold and silver, platinum. They don't want to be making this into a hydroxide and throwing it in a landfill. So they're going to treat these differently. Uh, evaporation, ion exchange, reverse osmosis uh, are one ways to actually retain this material. Uh, there's a gold, there's an operation down in Attleboro, Mass. called the Robbins Company, and they are a gold house. They have gold, and they make uh, awards for companies you know, the 25-year pin, the gold pen, the plaque on the wall for the good project or what have you, and they actually have gold in there. Uh, it's all you can do to go in and out of that place, of course, getting on an airplane. And what they do is evaporation. They'll take all that waste and they'll just boil all the water out. And then they'll take and refine the gold from that slag that they end up with. Ion exchange can be used because you can buy specific ion resins that will target specific metal ions. So you can recover your silver and ion exchange resin, then you send the resin out to a recovery house, they extract the silver and give you the value of it. You're not throwing that money away. 
Yeah, once we form those precipitates, we have to go through all the various solids removal methods, much similar to what we just saw. Uh, typically, when we go through uh, clarification stuff, we'll go through coagulation, flocculation, then liquid separation. Coagulation, we're going back to using those polymers again. First step is we'll add something. We've gotten away from the uh, inorganic salts to polymers now. We'll add this to neutralize those charges and we'll form a flock. So again, we'll jump in here. We want to form a flock with coagulation. We add the material to very rapid and intense mixing. We want all of this material to be exposed to the coagulant. And then we're going to send it through our flocculation. We'll add a separate coagulant or flocculant type of material. And then a nice gentle mix. Now we just want these flock particles to bump into each other and form some mass of substance, is what we're doing. So this is a nice, gentle, slow mix. We're going to treat it with kid gloves from here on out so we don't break it up. Again, we go through clarifiers, centrifuges, filtration, very similar to what we saw before, but on a different scale, generally. Large industry will use big clarifiers like we've seen on the municipal side of things. This lamella clarifier is more typical of an industry, and they come in a variety of sizes. This particular unit has everything you need. I've got this small tank on the lower right with a mixer on my coagulation phase. High intense brief mixing goes into a larger tank with a slow mixer for flocculation and goes directly into my clarifier. And these, uh, you see a bunch of plates inside the clarifier. These are called lamellas. And they're there to facilitate the separation of the solid and the liquid. Uh, the idea being that close spacing between these plates so you can separate very quickly as opposed to this flock particle trying to flow through four feet of water and try to come up. So that facilitates the separation, much more common in industry. Dissolved air flotation, very similar to what we just saw a little while ago. Again, look at the process if you saw it here in the bottom, oil water separation, then we got coagulation and flocculation, then we go in, same deal with the recycle stream and the air pressure. Uh, causing this stuff to float and concentrate. Centrifuges, again, batch or continuous belt thickness. Similar type of uh, gravity filtration is very common uh, in larger types of operation. Uh, when you get down to smaller operations, this type of stuff, a little bag filter. Uh, basically, a uh, polypropylene, polyethylene type of a, a bag that sits inside this filter housing. You just run your stuff through until your pressure is prohibitive, shut it down, drain it out, take this thing, up, put it in a 50-gallon drum, it will get shipped offside as waste. Some have uh, filter cartridges, long cartridges, as you see on the right. That's a scale, that's a 55-gallon drum kind of scale for this one. It wouldn't be bigger than that. Uh, no, those are generally pretty small. You might have some that are two to three feet long, but you know, once you take the sock out, yeah, that's, that's pretty small. A relatively small operation. But you can get down, you know, half micron level pretty easily, pretty tight filtration. You get a nice clean stream coming out of that. Uh, this is a plate filter. We're getting to a larger operation now. We need more surface area. It's just a series of plates inside this housing. I'll have a, a backing screen and then a cloth filter. Same thing, run it until it's loaded up and your pressure is too high, then you can break it down and you take this apart and all of the Paper uh, circles with their cake, take it, throw it in a drum, and get disposed of. And then we get bigger and bigger and bigger as we go. It's a small size of a recessed cavity filter. And then we talk about membrane filtration, which is the tightest filtration going, get down to RO. This is different from your typical filtration. In a, in a typical filtration, uh, what we're doing is we're passing material through a media and solids are being retained on that medium. What we've got in ultrafiltration, membrane filtration, is what we call cross-flow filtration. Uh, if you look at the, you've got a series here, we've got an equalization tank, some pumps, we go into a process tank, and this process tank keeps recirculating through the ultrafiltration unit on the right-hand side. It's a pressure-driven process, and unfortunately, folks online won't be able to see this. But, uh, the membrane allows certain materials to pass through it and other things not to. 
of that plain membrane, my flow runs parallel to the membrane, and the pressure allows, say, the water to pass through the membrane, but the oily portion stays on this side and gets concentrated. We don't build up a layer of solids like we do in a typical filter. It just allows stuff to go through. So you keep recirculating this until your retentate, the stuff that can't pass through the membrane, gets to a certain concentration that you're, you're happy with. You say, okay, I'll take that out, and then boom, I've got to concentrate that I can feel to. But then you've got nice clean water on the other side. So it's a whole different type of a filtration. The other one, and you can get down to RO, which is the tightest filtration going, and can require pressures up to about 1,200 PSI to drive that process. Granular carbon is employed in industrial treatment. Granular carbon removes color, removes odors, picks up organics, works very well. Uh, it's like uh, very small charcoal, if you want to look at it. If you bought a whole house filter for your water system, it's probably got charcoal inside that. And the secret to this stuff is the huge amount of surface area that you get with granular carbon. One gram, a spoonful, has basically a quarter acre of surface area on it. And what it does is it traps molecules inside all of these crevices inside. That's where all the surface area is. They'll burn certain materials at a high temperature, then they'll quench it. It causes it to fracture that way so that you've got all of these openings in there. And you basically use it like a regular filter. You just load up a tank full of granular carbon, pass your material through, take out color, take out odors, all sorts of it's used in filtering air streams. Can be taken out and regenerated through something like a multi hot furnace. <clears throat> we talked about uh, methods of saving the precious metals. Evaporation ion exchange. Okay. Methods where you can actually get your money back. You know, throwing it away is a waste. So, nice, simple little ion exchange system. Get them as big or as small as you need. Uh, air stripping, if I have a contaminant in my water stream that I can remove by changing my physical conditions, uh, I actually employed this for ammonia removal from our wastewater stream before we get into nitrification. Basically, you've got a uh, countercurrent stream. You've got contaminated water comes into the top of a, the stripper unit. Inside there, you have various types of uh, media, rings, that sort of stuff just to give a lot of surface area and your airstream goes in the opposite direction. And what you do is you change the volatility of this material. You take our wastewater stream, add caustic, bring the pH up to 10, and ammonia can't stay in solution anymore. So we'd run it through here and the airstream would pick up that ammonia and take it away for processing elsewhere. And I'd have a ammonia-free stream coming out of the bottom of this. Change the temperature, volatility changes various things. If I had a contaminant that I wanted to recover, if it was a solvent of some sort or something like that, I could take that airstream and then run it through a condenser. Uh, the hot uh, air and stuff goes through, hits the cold pipe, the solvent would come out of uh, the airstream as a liquid, and I can contain that. Or if it's something that I don't want, I'll just run it through a thermal oxidizer and burn it off. It goes off the CO2 and water. It's gone. Again, when it all comes down to it, this is why there are pre-treatment programs. That if they mess up your sludge, you go after them. They're the ones that have to do it. That's why we have the pre-treatment programs in there, so that that does not occur. But again, it varies from state to state as to how this is handled. I ran an industrial waste treatment facility with a design rate of 500,000 gallons a day, direct discharges to the Merrimack River. We had, you, know, you name a chemical, we probably had it, and there was not a certified operator to be found. That's New Hampshire. Go figure. Down here would be a great four facility for sure. It all depends on the state and how they do it. Vermont has their way of doing it. Uh, Maine has kind of a strange little industrial certification. I don't know what... New York may or may not have, but EPA still has it out there. The facility has to keep an eye on their industrial uses on a regular basis. So it's not a bad job either, pre-treatment board. That's the quick and dirty, and I do mean quick and dirty, on industrial treatment.
Any questions? Any last minute questions from uh, folks calling in? Feel free, I'll give you another minute or so, but I know you're probably uh, ready for lunch, so I'll give it a minute and then we'll wrap up if there's no questions. Any questions in the room? Thanks, Jim. Round of applause for our trainer. Jim, thanks folks for calling in. Uh, just like last time, we'll, we'll post this video online so you can check that out. And if there's any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'll make sure to get your questions. Jim, thanks everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, folks. Do you want to feel